Good morning, all. I'd like to welcome you to this symposium on decolonization and decoloniality, presented as a webinar um, from the University of Cape Town. It's a great event that gives us an opportunity to celebrate the work that we've been doing in this area. And I'd uh, like to welcome our team of presenters, um, Vice Chancellor Katie Pakeng, who, who started this work out. And then we have three presentations. Um, uh, Katie will introduce each of the projects as we um, as we proceed into them. And we'll have presentations from each of these um, projects which have been running on, on decoloniality for the last three years. Um, they re represent the work of Shosi Kesi and Floretta Bonzaya, which Shosi will present, the work of um, Shadra Kura, um, which he will present, and then the work of Luwazi Luchaba and uh, Ziana Latakam, which they will present together. Each of these presentations will be followed by a question and answer session, and we ask you to please um, uh, make, uh, use the question function um, and, <clears throat> and pose your questions for our speakers. And then this will, this will present the work which we've been doing around decoloniality at UCT. And from there, we're going to a panel discussion talking, talking about our way forward and the impact this should have um, on UCT's, um, on UCT's uh, curriculum, research and, and community. And I'm very pleased that um, we have a panel of four. Um, Kasturi uh, Bahari Leek, June Van Hutchinson, Elwani Ramagondo, and Rebecca Ackerman, and both DDCs, uh, Loretta Ferris will moderate it, and Liz Langer will um, summarize at the end. So thank you for being with us, and I'm now going to pass over to our Vice Chancellor, Akiti Pakeng, to give the introductory um, um, welcome and um, introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sue, um, and thank you for running this program today. I know members of the UCT executive are also attending today, and some of them are also participating in the program. So let me recognize Professor Loretta Ferris, our DVC for Transformation, as well as Associate Professor Les Lange, DVC for Teaching and Learning, and thank them for the collaboration and teamwork with all of us in presenting this webinar today. The subject for our discussion today is decoloniality or decolonization of knowledge production more specifically. The notion of decoloniality signals a shift in the locus of knowledge production. It is a theoretical attitude which instead of privileging Western rationality, legitimates other non-European geocultural locations and marginal subjectivities as places of enunciation and as spaces of thinking. According to Maldonado Torres, a leading theoretician of the idea, the decolonial turn is about making visible the invisible and about analyzing the mechanisms that produce such invisibility or distorted visibility. Decoloniality as a theoretical lens has enabled us to pose the question, what does knowledge look like when Africa becomes the locus of thinking or when our thinking emerges from Africa or from being African? And this is an important question as we navigate our project of transformation. The benefits of embedding our lenses of inquiry within Africa and formulating our research questions from Africa as a place of thinking is that it may enable us as a university to respond meaningfully to the pressing need to transform or at the very least, cultivate a cadre of intellectuals who possess the epistemological outlook and capital necessary to engage meaningfully with the growing challenge of decolonization. To this end, UCT seeks to promote an ethic of thinking that places a premium on knowledge that responds to the present problems of South African society and the African continent while contributing to global knowledge. Working towards this ideal, in 2017, we published a call for three-year research projects with aims to contribute to a new knowledge ethic and to, culti to cultivate a new intellectual culture by re-centering research on questions with a distinctive focus on and of particular relevance to the African continent. We invited UCT staff to submit interdisciplinary collaborative proposals that provide new thinking 
about the problems that should most urgently be addressed by UCT as an African university. We received 17 proposals, very competitive, and they were assessed by a panel of assessors and three of the proposals won the three-year grants. And those proposals were led by Associate Professor Shose Kesi and Professor Floretta Mbozao leading a joint pro project, Dr. Loazi Lushaba and Professor Shadrach Chirukuri. They started their work in 2018, and this being the third year, 2020, we thought it is time for us as a community to hear from them. The projects that they will present shortly are precisely an attempt to destabilize the accepted view of knowledge by rendering visible and audible the views of those previously excluded from the institutionalized body of thought. They, in different ways, highlight the interpretive transformation which occurs when coloniality is employed as a theoretical lens through which to disentangle the different disciplines that privilege Western cultural logic. In a sense, part of what the decoloniality grant was meant to do was to foreground non-Western modes of being in the world, as well as non-Western modes of cognizing or thought. This webinar is a step towards deconstructing the colonial model and its influences in different areas of our life. We will explore different moments in the non-Western world around the emergence of decolonial thought and discourse, specifically around African and feminist psychological knowledge, the decolonial imperative within the context of South African studies, lessons we are learning about local knowledge from archeological sites, the role of community-based research, experimentation and beneficiation in the global South, and decolonization in the context of UCT's Vision 2030. Back in 2017, I congratulated the grant holders for their successful proposals. And today, I want to thank them for, for being available to share their work with us. They will each deliver their presentations one after the other. So I will introduce them to you now, and then they will then get on and make their presentations. We will first hear from Professor, Associate Professor Shose Kesi of the Department of Psychology, and she will present the results of her collaboration with Professor Floretta Bonzaro, who's not able to be with us today, but their work on the hub for, de for decolonial feminism psychologies in Africa, which they co-direct. Associate Professor Kesey is Dean of the Faculty of Humanities. Her research centers on political psychology, community participation and mobilization, with a key focus on photo voice methodologies as a participatory tool to raise consciousness and mobilize community groups into social action. Professor Bonzaros writes and works in feminist, critical, and decolonial psychologies with emphasis on subjectivity, race, gender, sexuality, gender, and sexual violence, as well as feminism, feminist decolonial methodologies. The second presenter, if he's able to join us in time, is Professor Shadrach Chirukure, and he will present his research on archaeological sites and villages as laboratories of local knowledge towards community-based research, experimentation, and beneficiation in the Global South. Shadrach is Professor of Archaeology and Director of the Archaeological Material Laboratory at UCT. His research combines techniques from humanities and social sciences with those from the hard sciences to explore ancient African technologies, relating them to wider political economies of pre-colonial societies. He will be presenting from the UK, where he is a British Academic Global Professor at Oxford University. The third presentation will be by Dr. Loazi Lushaba and Ms. Ziana Latehan, and they will present on the decolonial imperative within the context of South African studies and African perspective. Dr. Lushaba lectures in UCT's Department of Political Studies. His publications include From National Liberation to Democratic Renaissance, which he co-audited with Professor Cheryl Hendricks of the University of Johannesburg. Another of his publication is Development as Modernity and Modernity as Development. Ms. Latakhan is a UCT alumna 
a South African and Fulbright scholar who is currently working towards her PhD in comparative literature, specializing in philosophy, literature, and criticism at Binghamton University in New York. Her areas of interest include social and political theory. I will just in a moment hand over to Associate Professor Kesey, and then I will ask if Professor Shilkure is online, he will follow Professor Kesey. If he's not yet online, we will proceed from Professor Kesey to Dr. Lushaba. I will not come up to introduce them, but you'll just see if that sequence changes, it's simply because Professor Chirukure hasn't been able to join us. Shose, over to you. I'm going to share my presentation. Oh. Let me try again. Sorry, it seems not to be working. to share it and you can let me know to go to the next slide. Yes, I think Nico, that would probably be the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I want to start by uh, thanking our Vice Chancellor, Professor Pakeng, for um, the opportunity to to um, present uh, the work of the Hub today and everybody who's been involved in putting together this, this webinar. Um, and I want to send apologies on behalf of uh, Professor Bonzaya, who is unable to Everyone's join us. Um, I know she was looking forward to it and that many of the listeners were, were looking forward to listening to her talk about her research. So I'm going to talk about the Hub. <clears throat> And the Hub for Decolonial uh, Psychologies in Africa was launched on the 11th of April 2018. And uh, it was funded through the Vice Chancellor's um, Decoloniality Initiative. The body of research that would be undertaken in the Hub would cover questions of institutional racism, uh, gender and sexuality research, the identity related impacts of land dispossession, as well as contemporary forms of urbanization and gentrification. We sought to apply a decolonial feminist psychological lens into social movements, leadership and activism. These, we argued, could contribute to new understandings of political behavior beyond conservative traditional psychological research on attitudes, conformity, minority influence and crowd behavior that have dominated the field. Next slide, please. In June 2018, we hosted our first colloquium. At that colloquium, our late colleague, Professor Hari Garuba, reminded us that decolonization means putting the needs of the disenfranchised first. Oftentimes, decolonizing our disciplines entails slipping into a place of disciplinary void, a place where one's discipline does not readily have the tools necessary to free itself from the conceptual problems it has created. Being in such a space gives one the means to see the possibility and impossibility of centering questions that concern us and the degree to which we are able to let those questions drive us. Within our discipline, this void can be understood as a conceptual deficit, one that has made us aware that we need new ideas to address the situation we had observed in both our research and in the, within the classrooms in which we teach. Next slide. Psychology as a discipline and the effects of psychological research have managed to alienate us from ourselves. Most crucially, we have for some time observed how our discipline has increasingly alienated our students from themselves and the life worlds they occupy outside the academy. Next slide. 
We have written at length about how psychology and psychological knowledge more broadly has historically served the interests of particular dominant groups in society. Psychology has been critiqued for its complicity during colonization and apartheid and for contributing to reinforcing ideologies of white supremacy. Feminist scholars have pointed to how psychology as a discipline has maintained an androcentric focus and worked to maintain a heteropatriarchal status quo. Whether white, heterosexual, middle-class, able-bodied male experience is a position from which generalizations and theorizations have been produced and cast as normative. Here we are particularly keen to point out that psychology's role in regulating behavior and constructing what is considered normal cannot be understated. We can see that in the ways in which the experiences of the poor, of black people, of women, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and intersex populations have not only been written about, but also the ways in which they have been deeply pathologized. Furthermore, our discipline has persistently maintained a northern centric approach in its privileging of knowledges and approaches produced in the global north and its reliance on southern contexts for the mining of data and producing the idea that relevant theorizing is only possible in northern contexts. All of this has profound consequences for the everyday lives of people about whom psychology theorizes. Next slide. The situation I have just outlined brings us to what can be regarded as a disciplinary cul-de-sac. How do we counter the situation where the production of psychological knowledge from Africa and about people who live on this continent is almost university, universally oriented towards the West, especially considering that it does so in ways that entrench colonial ways of representing the other. Is such a psychology capable of humanizing the African subjects whose humanity has been seen as less absolute? Can a psychology that continues to discipline and reproduce essentializing and stigmatizing tropes, especially of those who are already marginalized, ever produce knowledges that affirm the humanity of those about whom it theorizes. We would argue that it cannot, unless it cuts the umbilical cord which ties it to the project of coloniality. Next slide. In our proposal for funding for what would later become the hub for decolonial feminist psychologies in Africa, we communicated an intention for this space to work towards the very necessary theoretical and methodological expansions in our field. In many ways, we have achieved this goal. The hub for decolonial feminist psychologies in Africa exists in two forms. First, a discursive space, wherein knowledge about the psychologies of people from our continent and beyond could be theorized, where we could also counter some of the alienating conceptions of African subjects, who are mostly othered by Western hegemonic articulations of theories of being. Secondly, the hub exists as a physical space in which postgraduate students of psychology can engage their peers and us as critical feminists invested in em emancipatory forms of both the practice and theorization of psychological knowledge. Next slide. We intentionally designed both these instantiations of the hub to be student-centered the student-centered approach is evident in both how we enact our teaching and in the forms of learning that would emerge from the space. It is the crisis of modern forms of coloniality together with our students' expressed needs which drive the agenda of the hub. Both these strategic maneuvers are our response to the imperative to transform South African psychology departments. For us, such a response must center the production of knowledge that is relevant for our context and such knowledge ought to also center the very place from which and for which it is produced. Next slide. The activism of students at our own institution has made clear how they have no appetite for the stale Western diet we, we fed them for decades. Spaces such as the hub are therefore well placed to work towards bringing about the changes we all long for, a decolonized African university. Next slide. So how do we go about the work of decolonizing our discipline? Being aware of the necessity to disrupt the processes of inferior, inferiorization and othering 
that have been the legacy of our discipline's proximity to systems of oppression, we have taken steps to actively bring about the changes we see as necessary for the transformation of psychological knowledge production. Of course, there can be no decolonization of our discipline without attending to what is considered the canon. By this we mean, if there is to be a decolonization of psychology classrooms in African universities, beyond pedagogic interventions, there ought to necessarily be a decolonization of the very materials we present to our students as legitimate and valid scholarship. Next slide. Towards these aims, from the launch of the Hub in 2018, we have actively encouraged our students to contribute towards the psychology scholarship produced within the academy. Such scholarship is critical in its orientation and apologetically political and has Africa as its locus of enunciation. It attempts to overcome the perceived inferiority of the peoples of this continent by de demanding that as a starting point, we take seriously the humanity, the wealth of philosophies, the cosmologies of this context as worthy of inquiry, not as a poor cousin of Western thought, but as valid and important for their own sake. As such, between 2018 and this year, the collective membership of the Hub has published four edited volumes, 18 book chapters and 12 peer-reviewed articles. There's a monograph um, coming out soon and a co-authored co book on Pan-Africanism and psychology in decolonial times. Um, so too an edited volume on decolonial en enactments in community psychology and a number of forthcoming peer-reviewed publications. Among these publications, we are most proud to have brought out the first edited volume on decolonial feminist community psychology to come out of the continent. That volume has been used in both undergraduate and postgraduate classes, and a few of the volume's chapters were authored by our, our own postgraduate students who in some cases have taught their own work in the courses that we convene. Next slide. Towards addressing the transformation of psychology classrooms within our institutions, we have trained our senior postgraduate students to collaborate with us in our teaching. This achieves two things. Students are exposed to the most contemporary research that situates itself as a decolonial, as decolonial feminist, and they get to interact with emerging academics whose work indicates the possibilities of a transformed decolonial and feminist psychology. We take this training seriously, given that if we fail to train black graduate students for eventual careers in the academy, there is no likelihood of ever changing the face of who is imagined as worthy of being in front of a classroom within this institution, nor in any academic space. Next slide. We have also worked to address what we have seen to be an overlooked problem within the project of decolonization how the disruption and eradication of colonialism um, has been largely framed and enacted in ways that mimic the masculine view of being in the world, synonymous with coloniality. In our publications, we have argued that some of the social movements around decolonization have faced challenges and that, they, and that there are contestations around these movements, marginalization of intersectional feminist concerns and politics. These challenges of social movements illustrate the importance of black feminist work to the decolonization project. Works that must foreground gender and other intersectionalities. Both decolonial and intersectional feminist perspectives recognize the important ways in which identities and experiences like race, class and gender are intertwined. Next slide. The hub as a physical space embraces an activist decolonial aesthetic and praxis for psychological work in South Africa, Africa and the diaspora. Within the space of the hub, we have engaged in dialogues around issues of gender based violence and racialized violence, the stigmatization and oppression of poor and working class communities and methodologies that promote the participation and collective action of marginalized groups. These dialogues are not only within our colleagues, um, with our colleagues in different departments, both within UCT, as well as within the continent, but also with wider publics and activists. For example, we hosted a dialogue on decolonial psychology 
with colleagues and postgraduate students from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology in August 2019. For Women's Month, the Hub collaborated with the UWC Women and Gender Studies Department to host a two-day event on art and activism as scholarship for gender and social justice. This brought together artists, activists and scholars to counter dominant scholarship and pedagogies on gendered violence. Next slide. We have held screenings and debates on social issues that are of concern to South African publics. All of these have been geared towards making space for pluriversal knowledges about human life and ways of being in the world. Our students host and facilitate discussions on issues related to the work that they do and many of these discussions are open to the public and we have found that including activists, social movements and wider South African public has entrenched a culture of understanding that the academy, with its propensity to co-opt social movements, cannot be the loudest voice in issues of social change. It is because of this spirit that our activities have been largely collaborative. Next slide. In our first year, we co-hosted a symposium with the Transdisciplinary African Psychologies Program, the Research Unit on Men and Masculinities of the Institute for Social and Health Sciences at UNISA, and the Violence, Injury and Peace Research Unit at the South African Medical Research Council. In this symposium, we asked, what does an African-centered decolonial feminist psychology look like in practice? What, it, what can it offer students? What demands does it make on researchers, university teachers and administrators? We ask these questions knowing that the disciplinary approaches that have brought us to the point where the questions need to be asked cannot really, readily have answers for them. Next slide. A year later, in partnership with the Academy of Science of South Africa, we hosted the Distinguished Scholar Professor Nelson Maldonado Torres for a week in February in 2019. At UCT, he met with faculty staff, students and activists, delivered a public lecture and engaged in reflective dialogue with student, student activists on what, had, what has happened and where we find ourselves four years since Rose Must Fall movements. Next slide. In our first year of this project, we undertook a networking trip to Tanzania to visit potential collaborators at the University of Dar es Salaam. As part of that visit, we also met with two NGOs working within the field of gender justice. In the second year, um, in the second year we went to Dakar, Senegal, where we met with the Dean and Heads of Departments um, in Humanities Faculty from the University of Sheikh Anta Diop and discussed establishing the field of decolonial feminist psychology in Africa and plans to develop collaborative teaching materials. At the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, CODESRIA, we, dis we discussed collaboration and work on our project, especially with respect to publishing the outputs of an edited collection in CODESRIA's Pan-African co-publication series. Our next visit will be to our partner institution, the Muntu Institute in Cameroon, um, and the director of the Institute, Professor Parfait Akana, was, uh, did attend the launch and, in 2018 and, and gave a lecture. Next slide. In 2019, Floretta and I became co-editors of Psychology and Society, a South African journal known for its critical stance on psychology and on society. In the same year, we have also joined RINGS, the International Research Association of Institutions of, the, of Advanced Gender Studies. Our membership in this network connects us with leading research institutes and centers from Africa, Australia, Europe, and North and Central America, with the aims of facilitating collaboration and contacts within gender studies centers across the world. This is important because the knowledge we produce while centering our context is for the world. Next slide. <clears throat> The Hub has bi-monthly um, lunch hour sessions with our students where they, they lead discussions on issues related to decolonial feminism. And in these talks, we center feminist praxis and covers topics such as emancipatory methodology, writing and academic publication. In our series of Hub Talks, 2019 saw an increase in invited speakers from outside the discipline of psychology among which we may mention colleagues from the politics department 
and independent scholar, Dr. Jade Gibson. Next slide. This year, we have sought to disrupt the narratives that emerge out of academic scholarship by centering questions that trouble the tropes and stereotypes on particular racialized subjects prevalent, preva prevalent in both our society and particularly the academy. Our students and research associates have presented emancipatory ways of researching gendered subjectivity, race and place. Some of these talks have looked at representations of townships among wealthy tourists from northern countries, showing how neoliberal and colonial discourses operate together to produce sanitized representations of townships that both obscure inequalities be between poor residents and wealthy tourists from the global north and depoliticized issues like poor infrastructure in townships. Next slide. As part of thinking about who our work is for, we collaborated with colleagues within the institution. We hosted, for instance, a highly successful workshop with Tandon Tunja, a media lecturer at UCT, who presented on South African media strategies for repack repackaging our research. This was important to the, to the dissemination of our students' work to broader publics beyond the academy. Much of this work is ongoing and speaks to the relevance of our research for the place we live in. Next slide. We also hosted a successful book launch and dialogue, Nadira Omaji's Reimagining Academia by Putting the Last First, and also introduced the edited volume, The Colonial Feminist Community Psychology, co-edited by Hub Director Florette Bonzaya. Both these launches were aimed at cultivating dialogue between activists, both within and outside the academy. Next slide. Among our collaborations, one important intervention was the exhibition we held with the Advancing Woman Project, which was curated by Hub member and PhD candidate Sky Chirape. The exhibition centered on the idea of intersecting violences and was the culmination of years of research on gendered violence and its intersections with race, sexuality and nationality. Next slide. Among the highlights of our project thus far, we are most appreciative of the writing retreats we offered our students and associated researchers. These retreats, beyond being opportunities to mentor the writing of these emerging scholars, they, are, they also worked towards the publication outputs we mentioned earlier. Next slide. Of course, to make meaningful the ideas we are bringing to our discipline, it is also necessary that we encourage our students to share the meaningful work that they do with other scholars working within similar aims. Through funding mechanisms such as the VC's Decoloniality Project and others, we have taken our students to join us in roundtables at national and international conferences that have taken us as far as Santiago de Chile recently and um, Antwerp in, in Belgium. Next slide. We are especially proud of the connections we have made with centers on the African continent. While we are aware that much of what made our wide ranging engagements possible, was thanks to the grant we, grant we received. We are also convinced that what we have started here will endure long past the end of this funding cycle. The work of decolonizing psychology is a lifelong project, and we appreciate that we embark on it with the young ac academics we mentor. We are grateful for the space that has made our students see that a decolonial feminist psychology is already here and that they can be instrumental in bringing the changes that we need. Next slide, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shosi, for a great presentation. Very interesting and huge amounts of things which have been done in the last uh, three years, really moving um, our space in uh, forward at UCT. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have a, a number of questions placed by the, um, the audience um, for you, and I'd like to um, start with the question from Taluni um, Makonta. Thank you, UCT, for such an initiative and contribution in making Africa great again in the sector of knowledge. My question is, how do we ensure that those who are decolonized by your hard work uh, sustain, that they are sustained, um, for example, students going out after graduating, 
going to a workplace that is fully colonized in a village which is still con controlled by neo-colonization. Mm. Would you like me to go ahead and... I think I'll have you, I'll just come one at a time, so if you'd like to go ahead that would be great. Yeah, I mean that's a great question. It's 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 <laughs> it's. Uh, I think what's important to understand about the spaces that we are in is not just the the academy that needs to be decolonized. It's the we're talking about society in general, and I guess what we try and, and leave with our students is a different way of thinking about themselves, different way of thinking about the continent and the world around them, and hopefully that will carry those thoughts and understandings will carry them um, to whatever they, they go to next. And yes, they will encounter difficulties, but it's, it's hoped that, you know, with, with the engagements and the critical thinking that they would have um, learnt um, and developed um, at university, that it will serve them well. Um, in preparing them for life outside of the university, but also for being critical of life outside of the university. Great, thanks very much. Um, let's, uh, let's move on then. Um, it's a question from Jennifer um, around uh, reflecting on family systems in South Africa, which were broken during apartheid. How can we decolonize these systems by producing new knowledge on how families function um, in the here and now? How can we strengthen families through lenses of the global south, especially our mothers, enabling transform transforming oppressive patterns that are producing children and youth who do not have a sense of belonging? And mm. ah, very another very nice, interesting question, difficult question. <laughs> um, um, I have a, um, a student at the moment who's actually doing a PhD on marriage um, and trying to understand um, marriages in, in Zimbabwe and child marriages in particular or, or people who get married under the age of 18. Um, and it's very interesting the types of findings um, that are coming to the fore and how, you know, the whole concept of marriage is kind of rooted in, well, the contemporary concept of marriage and family is very much rooted in, in colonial notions. Um, and, and so I think that kind of work and that kind of research can very much help us um, understand and contribute to uh, disentangling and dis dismantling um, very gendered, racialized and, and colonial ways of thinking around uh, marriage and community. Um, so, and family, I guess the question was more about family. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is not a, an area of, of focus in my own research, but I, I think that there, are, there is work in the hub uh, going in, in that direction. Um, and I would welcome anybody who, who's interested in engaging in these issues to, to make contact with us. Thanks very much, Shosi. I'm, I'm going to go to maybe a slightly more straightforward question, but then I wondered, um, how is the hub funded? And are there plans for the hub to, con to conduct decolonization sessions to, conscien to conscientize high school learners? Yes, I mean, uh, the, so the hub is funded through the decoloniality grant from the vice chancellor's office. Um, and then in some cases, for some of our, our other activities, uh, uh, we have used research funding that we have um, raised from elsewhere as well. And definitely um, the next priority of the hub is to um, attract new, new funding. Um, we haven't uh, reached out to high schools and I think it's an area that we should definitely explore. Well, I know that many of the students who are part of the hub 
and student activists um, have done that, have started that kind of work and have been doing it over some years. Um, but we haven't focused on that um, in the past few years of, of work in the hub, but definitely something uh, we could explore. So thank you for that suggestion. And thanks. I'm going to go on to um, just a, another comment on the hub itself from, from Sheila. Great work on the hub. Can, can past staff access it? Yes, fantastic. That would be absolutely fantastic. I mean, we we have open sessions open to the public. It's for everyone inside the university, outside the university. Um, uh, we obviously need to do better at publicizing this, this work and these sessions, but it's absolutely, um, we would very much welcome past staff to join in and participate. Great. And keeping going on the school's theme, um, there's a question. I, I'm wondering how we decolonize the school curriculum in a practical way and how tertiary institutions and teacher training programs are adapting to this need. There are many demands for the critical literacy and multiliteracy, but teachers still seem to come into teaching profession with traditional training. Yeah, I think that um, the panelists uh, who will be engaging with the audience a bit later on will be very well placed to answer that question. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, we what we have done in the hub is really focus on um, the content of our research and the content of the curriculum. And uh, these things need to be written. I mean, if 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 students and, and learners are not accessing materials um, that talks about them, their own histories, their own um, aspirations, uh, their own culture, then we cannot expect them to, to you know, have an um, experience of decolonial education. So we have been spending this time um, focusing on, on content and writing and publications and also dialogues and engagements. Um, but definitely, I think um, pedagogies are very important. In my own work, I use methodologies that are considered uh, quite innovative in psychology, which is quite a conservative traditional, um, has a conservative traditional history. And those types of methodologies are all about participation, community mobilization, building consciousness amongst people. Um, and communities um, so that people develop the skills to um, bring about changes in their own lives, but also very importantly in psychology, it's about challenging the idea that, you know, if, if, if you are different or if you are black or if you are a woman or if you are uh, living in a, in a disenfranchised uh, environment, that the problem is not with the individual. And that, that, that there's, there's, there's this relationship between the individual and the social environment. We are produced by historical, um, a historical environment and landscape. Uh, and often the problem with psychology is that it tends to psychologize, pathologize individuals um, as a way of explaining individual challenges and problems. So these are some of the really key um, aims of, of a decolonial psychology. Thanks. Thanks, Chaucy. Um, Amina asks, how has language been integrated into the process of decolonization in psychology? There's a lot of pressure on psychologists and critical thinkers to be able to think and express themselves verbally and in writing in English, whereas sometimes this is not our first language. A lot of psychological terminology is difficult to express in African languages. Yeah, that's an excellent question and it's a massive challenge. Um, I think it's a challenge in psychology, it's a challenge in all our disciplines, uh, how to make them accessible, but also how language can actually influence the actual concepts that we are, uh, uh, you know, I, I, as part of my presentation right at the beginning, I was talking about how we are struggling with the concepts that we have inherited from psychology to explain um, Africa, African contexts uh, and people. Um, 
So yes, absolutely, we need to draw on, on concepts from different languages to, to understand society better and to be able to better critique, provide a critique of society. Um, so yes, it's a massive challenge and it's one that I think needs a broader institutional engagement um, because we, disciplines cannot, you know, address the language issue in silos. I, I believe it's, it requires a broader institutional commitment to multilingualism um, in the academy. Thanks. Thanks, Josie. Lots of questions as to how your work um, relates into the work of, here at UCT. So Leanne says this project is a great example of how to do work of, of the university differently and decolonially in the direction of the world. How do you imagine you can best influence and disrupt traditional psychology at UCT and as a dis discipline so that the hub does not become separate from and purely outside the UCT psychology department? Yeah, um, I, I think that it's it's a challenge for all of us. So sometimes um, as scholars, we we can work in very in silos and it's a very individualistic project um, often the work of an academic because you focus on your research and you tend to teach your research in your classrooms. Um, but I think what has been encouraging in the past few years in the Department of Psychology is we have worked on changing the curriculum so that students coming for an undergraduate degree, they will be exposed to a broad range of topics. Um, and whereas previously you could choose quite early whether you wanted to branch out into clinical or focus on clinical psychology or focus on neuropsychology or focus on more social and critical forms of psychology. Now students have to do a little bit of everything and I think that's really important because it does mean that you get a broader uh, idea of what the discipline has to offer and, um, and you definitely get a critical perspective on the discipline. We have found over the years that students who who engage with social and critical forms of, of psychology tend to be the stronger students in the end. Um, I think precisely because of the critical analytical skills that they develop. Um, but also it, it's just about uh, producing psychologists who are better aware of the environment and the people they're going to be working with in their future careers. Um, and, and so, Yes, I think that there are practical, very practical ways of addressing um, this through the curriculum. Um, and hopefully the hub being located right there in the, in the Department of Psychology is going to be a space that attracts students, um, regardless of, of what type of psychology they, they are, are focusing on. Great, thanks, Josie. And then one last question, um, which goes into the academic project, is um, from Johanna Lakuta. My question concerns the role of publishing and the publishing industry on projects of decolonization. How important is it where and with which publisher we are publishing our work to advance the project of decolonization? And if we could just have a short answer, please. Thanks. Yeah, it's a it's an ongoing. Um question that I think the academic institutions on the continent must engage with. Um, often as scholars, we are, you know, rewarded for international publications, which tends to mean publications that are um, European or North American. And, and this is what gets us um, uh, promoted and so on. So we are measured to get in, in, in particular ways. And I think we need to work on um, promoting um, African-centered uh, journals, African-centered writings, um, and not be be too yeah. And 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 there again, you know, it's a, it's a, it's about finding striking a balance and finding and um, engaging the institution as a whole um, in understanding the and addressing the politics of, of publication much better. 
Thanks. Thanks very much, Shosi. Thanks for a wonderful presentation and for engaging so well with the questions. If you look through the questions channel, you'll find that there are a huge number of compliments for the work that you're doing. And we're really pleased that we can host this work at UCT. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sue. I'm going to move on now and um, welcome again uh, Dr. Lawazi uh, Lushaba and Ms. Sayana Latakang, who are going to pre uh, present their work um, in a project entitled on the, Deco on the Deco Colonial um, Imperative within the context of Southern Africa Studies, an African perspective. Thanks, Lawazi and uh, Ziana. Please go ahead. Um, the Commandante greets you, Chair, and the Commandante greets all the viewers. Um, we, are, we are very grateful to the University for having provided us, you know, with this grant in order to do the important work that we are doing, whose elements we are going to outline in a moment. I'm going to do a very short presentation, then followed by, you know, um, Ziana, who has been better than me actually at the center, you know, of the work of decolonizing social sciences at UCT, as we are going to see in a moment. So to get on with my part of, you know, this presentation, I want to begin by suggesting to you that if we accept that colonialism was not just a political and a military enterprise, at the center of it, there was another element. It was the intellectual element. It was ensuring that the colonized could not imagine themselves outside the framework provided for them by the colonialists. Because the guns alone would not be able to maintain and perpetuate colonialism. There was something even more important than the military and the guns. It was ensuring that the mental processes of those that were colonized were again dominated or controlled by the colonizers. Or to be more explicit, it was to ensure that the colonized thought exactly in the way in which the colonizers wanted them to think. And so if at the center of the colonial project was the intellectual project also of ensuring domination, it meant then that decolonization at the center of decolonization would be the task of rewriting knowledge in the image of the colonized so that the colonized would no longer appear in knowledge in precisely the ways in which the colonizers wanted them to appear. Now I want to suggest to you that those societies in the continent, because our study, you know, um, it's not just, you know, an addition that it's an African perspective. Our study is very much centered within, you know, African thought. Now, I want to suggest to you that those societies that have been very successful in decolonizing thought did so not on the basis of individual intellectuals. They did not fall into the trap of liberal meritocracy where you said you were going to promote academics on the basis of their individual merit. This project in societies that were successful depended on communities of scholarship. And now there are two examples that I'm going to suggest to you that you know um, have been very successful in this endeavor where these communities of scholarship succeeded in actually rewriting what was previously colonial thought. This is Nigeria and Tanzania or Dar es Salaam. In, in, in Nigeria, you had what became known as the Ibadan School of Social History, which thankfully, you know, I am a product of. Now, what happened in the Ibadan School of Social History is that you had the first generation of African intellectuals who accepted, who accepted as their responsibility, training a cadre of indigenous scholars in these countries. And so they took it as a responsibility, you know, that they had to actually postpone their individual upward mobility and focus more on training a cadership of indigenous intellectuals. 
Many of us were beneficiaries of that selflessness of the first generation of African scholars at the Ibadan School of Social History. You had a similar school, you know, in Dar es Salaam, the School of Radical African Political Economy that gave us many, you know, of the leading lines, you know, in African scholarship. Now, the modus operandi in these two schools, particularly in the Ibadan School of Social History, was that you had this African, this first generation of African intellectuals who brought a community around them of PhD and master's students, large numbers of them. You know, in my, in my set at Ibadan, there were hundreds of us doing PhDs. Now, when you had this community, you know, of students around, immediately after they finished their PhDs, they worked with these African intellectuals to turn these PhDs into publications, but not just publications, to turn them into books. What that meant is that within a short space of time, these societies created their own knowledge, their own repertoire of knowledge. They quickly were able to win themselves away from knowledge that is produced by the white academics or the white colonialists. Now, I suspect that that is one lesson that, you know, we bring through this project into the University of Cape Town. The second point I want to make is that it is precisely these communities of scholarship, like the Ibadan School of Social History, that made it possible, for instance, for Tandiga Kandawire to write in 1995, you know, an article titled Three Generations of African Scholars. This is 1995. Tandiga Kandawire is suggesting to us if I'm not suggesting, demonstrating to us that from 1960 up until 1995, most African countries had produced three generations of indigenous intellectuals. Now, if you count from 1960 to 1995, it's about 30 something years, 35, 36 years. If you look at South Africa, which has been independent for 24, 25 years, it doesn't have a single generation of indigenous intellectuals produced post-1994. Now, there is something raw in the models that we are having, in the models that we are following. So we should not be quick to celebrate. We should not be quick to celebrate on what we have done as the country thus far, because as I've just suggested to you, Tandigam Kandawire says to us, from 1960 to 1995, other African countries had produced three generations of African scholars in a space of 30 something years. In 24 years as South Africa, we've not produced a single generation of African scholars, of indigenous South African scholars. Now, what is a generation? So that you do not quickly say, well, there is so and so. A generation is a cohort of, scholarship, of scholars that are driven by the same ethic. And it can't be any other ethic in a country that has recently gained independence other than to produce knowledge that frees or that liberates the previously colonized and humanizes them. Now, why do I? And so this first generation of African scholars, you know, to um, emphasize the point was possessed of a certain ethic. That first generation that trained us at Ibadan was possessed of a certain ethic we said, which was they postponed their individual upward mobility and paid us attention as their students. Now what we lack in South Africa is precisely a committed generation of black intellectuals that will give itself selflessly in order to produce the next generation of indigenous intellectuals. Why do I seem to emphasize the production of indigenous intellectuals? It is because quickly in South Africa, there is a very disturbing trend where decoloniality and decolonization risk becoming a fashionable narrative, a money attracting theme for self-serving bourgeois intellectuals. And so quickly, decoloniality and decolonization has become just another way, you know, for self-serving bourgeois intellectuals to promote themselves. And you find, you find very disturbingly that people who claim to be 
doing decolonial scholarship actually lack the ethic necessary, lack the, the ethic necessary in order to decolonize, you know, uh, um, to decolonize knowledge. So I want to end by making the last point, which is that what we are doing as decolonizing social scientific thought as this collective is basically aimed at leading to an institute. So we are doing groundwork, you know, that will lead to an institute whose intellectual theme is going to be, you know, the phenomenology of black life. And so in the next few years, you know, we hope to institutionalize this work, you know, into a, a formal institute, but not just a formal institute, but also a school of thought that will lead, you know, to the production of knowledge that, you know, is in the image of black people in South Africa. So at this point, I'm going to stop and allow Ziana to take us through the life of the project because Part of what we pride ourselves in in this project is that we are not as teachers afraid, you know, to proclaim that we have produced students who are brighter than us as they are teachers. So Ziana is one such student who's brighter than those she has worked with as her teachers, you know, in this collective. She was very central to the crafting of the project and, you know, she continues to be central in its operations and she will take us through its life over the past three years. <laughs> Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, I feel that uh, that that introduction may have been a little bit uh, overstated, nevertheless. Um, so at the time that I was brought onto the project, I was nearing the submission date for my MA dissertation um, in the political studies department under the supervision of Professor Tivin Reddy, who I believe is in the um, audience today, the now HOD of the politics department. I was also working as a TA and tutor in various courses in the department. At the time, a large part of my fees and tuition was still outstanding. And at that stage, the amount would not be covered by the postgraduate funding office or the NRA. Luckily, working with Dr. Lushaba on this project meant that my time would be compensated. So my fees were covered and I was able to graduate. Not only this, but the work I did gave me experience in the organization of a project like this, especially because the project that I must emphasize this in its formulation and execution is specifically collective in nature in all of its aspects. Um, uh, sorry. Um, in many departments in the humanities, the postgraduate journey is made especially difficult uh, because black students lack the necessary direct support. Had it not been for Dr. Lushaba and Professor Reddy and the relationships we built through the project, I would not have had the support and letters of recommendation required to get the Fulbright Scholarship and get placed in a PhD program in the US. Preparation for graduate study is not merely based on your grades, but also on how confidently one is supported by the faculty that students are mentored under. With so few black faculty, the work of mentoring younger aspiring academics and researchers falls disproportionately on black academics themselves often newly appointed. White academics are seen as less approachable, less encouraging, and are insensitive or ignorant of the complexities involved in being a first generation graduate and are less aligned to our research interests, especially when these interests foreground societal concerns such as redress and inequality. A large part of this project was to produce an intellectual and professional environment in which black graduates and faculty felt supported, guided, mentored, and encouraged precisely in order to combat the isolation experienced by many black graduate students, which is a major deterrent to further study over and above the exorbitant financial costs. Our first undertaking was the establishment of a national working group uh, where a combination of young and more experienced black scholars from different parts of the country came together to discuss how we could develop a school of thought through collective intellectual production, publication, mentoring, in partnership with institutions across and beyond South Africa. Our initial meetings were mostly strategic planning meetings and thereafter became more intellectual in nature through in-house conferences, work in progress workshops, the decolonizing social scientific thought graduate seminar series, as well as a series of public lectures and public engagement talks. The success of the project was also made possible via ongoing partnerships with other institutions, specifically Ibadan University in Nigeria, and the close ties we had with the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, uh, Codestria. As it so happens, 
the National Research Working Group had an express purpose of marrying our primary goals to that of the National Development Plan goals, as, one as, as well as the NRF Strategy 2020. Um, so the NRF uh, supports students through bursaries and grants and so on, but we know as academics and researchers in the field that this is necessary but insufficient for the kind of collective and decolonized knowledge production scholarship that we are interested in. Overall, the objectives are clearly aligned. Furthermore, our aims align even closer with the transformation objectives for the of the NRF in its response to the NDP. The NRF performance plan states that the NRF will intensify its response in addressing the principles of DGS and the advancement of quality, effectiveness and efficiency, as well as public estate, as well as public accountability through the four dimensions of transformation, which our project is clearly aligned with. Um, not only this, but the first of these points, uh, the first and third are particularly relevant in our project as we do the actual work of producing the human resources necessary for a shift away from Eurocentric and colonial forms of knowledge production and toward a transformed relationship that scholars have with the broader community and the public, ultimately contributing to the NRF strategic outcomes, one of producing an internationally competitive, transformed and representative research system and four of producing a scientifically legit and engaged society together with their respective strategic objectives. So our decolonizing social scientific thought graduate seminar series. Uh, it was probably our most significant intellectual project undertaken by the National Research Working Group. Uh, the seminar series took the form of a series of week-long seminars where a leading academic would hold a daily three-hour-long session with 20 graduate students and some strong undergraduate students, in addition to doing a public lecture. The idea was to build an intellectual culture that would introduce students and faculty to internationally recognized scholars and research fields that lend themselves to thinking about a decolonized form of knowledge production. The seminars were at no cost to the students and took place outside of their formal academic commitments. In this environment, students were able to speak to each other and our guests about their own research interests and learn more about research work in other parts of the continent and the world. Significant partnerships were also fostered in this space and various sessions will be, will be were held throughout 2018 specifically, some of which I'll mention briefly. Uh, Professor Gosa Osagai, our research partner, is a professor of comparative politics at Ibadan. He was the vice cha chancellor of Igbedeon University in Okada, Nigeria, um, and was the 2017 Fanzel Slabu Chair of Politics and Sociology at UCT. We also had a week-long session with Peter Hudson, the now late Peter Hudson, a political theorist and researcher from Brits University as well as leading African philosopher, particularly in the Ubuntu, in philosophy of Ubuntu, uh, Professor Ramose. We also hosted Professor Zinema Gubane, uh, the former chair of the sociology department at Boston College in Massachusetts, who started a teaching career at UCT and is, has returned several times as a visiting scholar. Her work deals particularly with race and gender in the US and Southern Africa. Professor Adebayo Olakushi, the new chair of the Cadestria Scientific Committee. Professor Olakushi is the regional director for Africa and West Asia in the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance based in Addis Ababa and also formula, former executive secretary of Cadestria. He has vast experience leading institutions engaged in various intellectual and policy work. Students were given the opportunity to sit with another African philosopher, Professor Moreau, who works in the area of black existentialism and who in 2015 was awarded the Franz Fanon Lifetime Achievement Award by the Caribbean Philosophical Association, as well as Professor Hilton White, an anthropologist and researcher from WITS. This was the first uh, conference of the National Research Working Group where some of the basic ideas and projects were fleshed out and we elaborated on our individual research projects to establish any overlaps and links. From this engagement, we were able to see what possibilities existed for joint publication with, between experienced and younger scholars as evidenced by some of these. So our prospective plans, um, from 2018 to now, we have managed to achieve some success with the resources made available to us. 
Once we are able to, we hope to continue the graduate seminar series and host the winter summer school with prominent scholars and researchers in the humanities and social sciences. This should lead to at least a few graduate-led student publications within the next two to three years and other individual and collective publications. In addition, the collective provides a pool of resources that can increase the amount of black graduates and ultimately black PhDs committed to transformation in research, teaching and learning. The longer term hope is for everything we have done to be the groundwork for a graduate institute that is representative of a decolonized method of knowledge production. A formal graduate institute is the final long term aim of the project as it contributes directly to the national scientific and research goals outlined above and the decolonial imperative in the context of South African studies. Thank you so much, Sue. That's the end. Thank you, uh, Ziana. Um, great presentation. Thank you, uh, Nawazi. Um, we've got lots of questions coming in for, for you. Um, and so we'll we'll get going. Um, um, just trying to work out where we're going to start. Um, so maybe one of the really challenging questions for you, Dr. Lashaba, um, comes um, is, is this one. Might it not be arguable that the decolonization you have presented is one that compartmentalizes knowledge instead of fostering interchange between them? Might that not be a repetition of the past in that colonial knowledge itself excluded acknowledging others, knowledges, uh, whether entirely or whether distorting them? So a bit of a controversial question for you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, very relevant question. Um, I suppose that uh, I would rephrase the question and say that, you know, is knowledge that is confined within the disciplinary boundaries going to be able to decolonize the way in which we think about African modes of being in the world? Now, my answer is simply this. It is that the departmental or rather, you know, the disciplinary boundaries themselves are part of the colonial baggage. Because if you think critically of African forms of life, there is no moment when you can say that at this at this moment my life is social, at this moment my life is political, at this moment my life is anthropological and my life is religious. These, all of these realities, religious, anthropological and political, happen all at once, you know, without any separation. If you attend many of the ceremonies that black people hold, for instance, they are religious, but they are also educational. They are educational just as they are social, but also just as they are cultural. And so you find anthropologists who then go to study them and reduce them into their cultural significance and miss out the other elements, you know, in these, you know, uh, in these ceremonies. So I mean, no way. I mean, no way an advocate of knowledge that is contained within disciplinary boundaries because remember that many of these disciplinary boundaries are created precisely at the moment of modernity when Europe transitions, you know, from the medieval to the modern period. And many of these disciplines are actually brought about in order to respond to the exigencies that are thrown up by industrial capitalism. Psychology, for instance, you know, all the diseases that we study in psychology, anxiety, depression and whatnot, all of these are, dis are rather problems that are drawn up by mass, you know, um, mass community or mass societies or mass capitalist societies. And so I am certainly in no way, you know, uh, an advocate of disciplinary boundaries. The work we do, if you look at a bad way of demonstrating the point. If you look at the people we've invited, they straddle the array. In fact, uh, only one of them is a political scientist, you know, Professor Igosa Osaka. We've had anthropologists, we've had, you know, economists, we've had, you know, people in different fields. It is precisely out of recognition of the point that African life is not sociological, political, economic, and anthropological at different moments. It is all of those things all at once. Great. Thank, thank you very much. 
I'm going to go on to the question which comes from Hannibal uh, Mazamura. The Nigerian and, and Tanzanian examples are quite, quite inspiring, but I'm curious as to how these schools changed the knowledge generation. Did they not use Eurocentric epistemological approaches in an African context, thus maintaining col coloniality in the scholarship? Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so there are two things that, you know, the experiments I cited did, um, both the Nigerian Ibadan School of Social History and the Dar es Salaam School. One is that first they produced in large numbers their own intellectuals. Now, because I think part of the problem, what is the, one of the missing points in the way in which we discuss decoloniality or go about decoloniality or decolonization of knowledge in South Africa is that we talk about decolonization, but who are the scholars who are going to teach that decolonized knowledge? I mean, you can't have decolonized knowledge without the scholars who are interested, you know, in teaching that knowledge. Are you going to ask the very same scholars who produce colonial knowledge to now teach decolonized knowledge? Certainly not. So one of the first things that these, you know, experiments attended to was we have to produce in large numbers, not exceptions, please, not exceptions, not people who come and tell us I'm the first professor of this, you know, I'm the first black professor of that. We're not interested in exceptions. These experiments produced in large numbers, indigenous African scholars, such that if you today are interested in writing anything about Nigerian social scientific reality, you can do so without citing a single colonial scholar because they have their own scholars. So that's the first point. It is that you need your own intellectuals in order to be able to produce that kind of knowledge. The other requirement, of course, is the softer one. It is the kind of knowledge that gets produced. Now, the kind of knowledge that gets produced, you know, that these experiments produced is of different forms. One is that, again, maybe to take a slightly off example, one of the things that South Africa has benefited from is precisely that generation of Nigerian scholars who were produced. It is they who today populate, you know, many of our universities in South Africa. But there's something distinct about them. All of them, when you meet them, they speak their languages, which means that their own knowledges have, or their own realities have a possibility of existing at the level of concepts in their own languages. And so what they have done successfully is that you can pick texts in Yoruba, you know, that are concerned with virtually any subject, you know, and so what they've done is that they've been able, with that critical mass, they've been able to produce in their own languages this knowledge. Now, is it completely decolonized? Of course not. Contestation over whether, you know, uh, over that character of knowledge continues. But in that contest, if South Africa is in Cape Town, they are already in Johannesburg. We are lagging behind. The gap between us and them is that we are still in Cape Town. They are already in Johannesburg. They've attended to the critical steps, the foundational steps that are necessary in order that we may have that kind of knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next question, one which is liked by many of the people listening in. Um, how do we uh, promote decoloniality when academia is classist. Access to knowledge is limited already to registered students, yet when they leave, this access is blocked. How can we ensure decoloniality um, that is accessible for all? Over to you. I think Ziana is going to attempt that. Am I right, Ziana? Sure, sure. Um, I'd firstly like to mention uh, that I don't think anyone since, <laughs> since a rival, um, so sorry, so I don't think anyone has held more public lectures 
uh, both within and outside of the university than Dr. Lushava. And I think these are at this point widely available online. I think people who have never even heard of the politics department at UCT um, know of these lectures. Uh, this aside, I think um, there is a very serious problem with reconciling on an intellectual conceptual level the problem of having a decolonized university in a colonial society and so this kind of relationship is one that would need to be um, uh, discussed it's problematic more so because it's a kind of which one would have to be decolonized first and so i think uh, going back to what uh, Dr. Lushava had said earlier regarding uh, the ethic that is necessary for people who are going to be doing this kind of work is such that um, the actual institution of the university and its uh, sort of built-in hostility is something that we're actively working against as well um, and trying our very best to bridge a kind of gap between society, those who make it in, those who don't, uh, which is why many students who are so committed to the intellectual projects we were running were also students who were incredibly involved in having uh, not only decolonial higher education system, but a decolonial And so the express purpose here is to get rid of the business model of uh, the university um, quite openly. Uh, yeah, I think Dr. Lushav, if you'd like to add to that. Well, good. Thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, we'll go on to the next question um, from Lorata Madongo. When we label it as indigenous knowledge, are we not othering it? Saying that there is knowledge, then there is something else outside of knowledge, i.e. indigenous. Knowledge, which is a term actually coined by those who view our knowledge system as lesser, the colonizers. In decolonizing, um, can we not just name it knowledge? Um, <clears throat> no, very profound question. Um, because this is how the semiology of Western knowledge functions. It is that it creates an asymmetry between Western knowledge, not just Western knowledge, but everything Western. It's a dance, it's African dance, it's it's dress, it's African dress, it's everything, you know, it creates this asymmetry because the other one you have to qualify. Now, at a conceptual level, there of course has to be a new lexicon that we create of talking about the world that enables us to free ourselves from that borrowed lexicon that is colonial in its nature. Now, one, I am very emphatic on the indigenous because, you see, in South Africa, that has a different meaning other than just this conceptual, you know, framework. You know, in South Africa, um, when you say indigenous, you know, cater of intellectuals, I'm specifically meaning black, you know, um, you know, black, you know, um, black intellectuals. So I use that in order to emphasize that we need, you know, black South African, you know, intellectuals to be at the forefront because the next point about that is that we need this knowledge to also exist in our indigenous languages. So this is a convenient qualifier that I'm using, you know, uh, in the South African case, because, you know, one of the things that we cannot do to answer the question that was asked earlier on, how do we decolonize knowledge when, you know, the university education remains classist? The first point is that many black South Africans don't speak English. And so what we are suggesting is that for as long as knowledge for as long as the language of science in South Africa remains English, you re you've excluded the large majority of black people who will understand the things we are talking about if we were able to make this knowledge available in indigenous languages. Now, these things must cease to be an exclusive preserve. You know, they must become available in our indigenous languages. But in order for our indigenous languages to become the language of science, 
We also need the indigenous intellectuals to be able to translate it into indigenous you know, languages. So when I use the concept of indigenous intellectuals and indigenous knowledge, it is to drive home a certain point. At an intellectual level, there is this larger debate that we have to engage in, which is not maybe just a debate. We have to engage in a project to create a different lexicon with which to understand the world. Because the language we use today to understand the world is given to us by colonialists. It is already laden with assumed power relations between the West or white and black people, as I've just demonstrated knowledge, indigenous knowledge, dance, African dance, you know, knowledge and African studies, you know. Uh, I mean, how do you have African studies in the African continent? You don't need African studies in the African continent. You know, it is Europeans and Americans who should have African studies, you know. Uh, it is at home. This knowledge is at home here, you know. It should permeate all the disciplines but you go confine it you know in one institute it is because the way in which knowledge is organized ensures that asymmetry thank you very much thank you very much and with that um, we have lots more questions for you but our time is up and so we're going to need to move on i'd like to thank both you uh Luazi and uh, ziana for a great, great input. Uh, I will finish publishing all the questions onto the chat and you'll be able to see, um, you'll be able to see them and engage with them from there onwards. Thank you for that. It's my great pleasure next to welcome um, Professor Shadrach Chir Chirikura. Um, Shadrach is a uh, professor of archaeology and the director of the Archaeological Materials Laboratory um, at the University of Cape Town. He's currently a, a fellow in Oxford and the project he's talking about is archaeological sites and villages as laboratories for local knowledge towards community-based research, experimentation, and ben beneficiation of the global in the global south. Shadrach, welcome. We're very pleased you joined us. And over uh, to you. Thank, thank you so much. Let me try and put on my PowerPoint on the screen. Uh, for some reason, I cannot see the PowerPoint. So, Sh Shadrick, maybe... I will share it on your, your part. Just let me know when to move to the next slides. Okay, that's fine. So, can we have the title slide then? <laughs> Nico? Nico? It is live. Oh, okay. So um, the disadvantage of coming last is that uh, all the good points will be taken, but the advantage is that you also don't uh, take long speaking. So um, one of the things that comes to mind is that if you are in Cape Town, if you are in Johannesburg, then there is a tendency to view the places particularly those villages in places like uh, Guiani, Limpopo, and others as places that are remote and also are backward. They lack the sophistication of, um, of the cities. So even in terms of knowledge production, they are seen as the peripheries, as the, as the margins. So what happens if we um, decide to focus on those villages um, and the archaeological sites which they contain to make them the sites of um, knowledge production and in this case um, decolonial knowledge production. This is um, the a central question which our study has sought to, um, to address. And my co-principal investigators are Colette Dandara, Nomusa Makubu, and uh, Mano Ramsindela. Uh, next slide. So this slide um, is uh, supposed uh, to uh, show my uh, co-principal uh, investigators um, from interdisciplinarity is at the center of our approach um, from pharmacogenomics, art history and heritage to geography and um, 
environmental science. I agreed to speak on behalf of the team today on condition that uh, they will take all the uh, difficult uh, questions. Next slide, please. So one of the um, key things um, that we sought to achieve uh, when we got the uh, funding was to try and see if we cannot invest um, the funding to create um, a research and uh, teaching ecosystem that was going to survive a uh, post uh, the, the life of the of the grant. So dipping into African philosophies where the uh, thinking is that um, a seed uh, can produce um, a forest. So um, the presentation is in two parts then. The first part will talk about um, the result of one um, specific aspect of the research and the results that we got. But then the last part is going to talk about um, how have we used uh, the initial investment from the University of Cape Town to create a research ecosystem that will continue to uh, produce um, African-centered uh, knowledge, uh, village-centered knowledge, uh, post at uh, the life of this uh, of this grant. Um, next slide, please. So we are in this um, together with um, academic uh, collaborators uh, scattered across uh, the the world. Um, Jerry Augusto, um, Chakanesa Mavunga. We also have um, professional filmmakers um, such as um, Simon Bright, um, as well as uh, Ekene Asom. So what we are trying to do here is to break uh, those um, silos and create um, a knowledge uh, that is responsive to the many needs of, um, of the communities. So um, we also, next slide please, we also have um, the uh, non-academic um, collaborators, particularly in terms of village, uh, Richard Mabunda and, uh, and others, Lamson uh, Makuleke, in, um, as well as in the other uh, countries. Um, then um, the next slide, please. The big question that our project sought to ask was uh, conditioned by at least uh, two things. The first is that um, why do we rely on solutions developed outside the continent to address African problems? So half the time, the outsiders extract knowledge from our villages, patent it, and sell it to us as breakthrough innovations. So that is, um, of course, that speaks to the uh, coloniality of um, uh, knowledge uh, production. I'm sure quite a lot has been said um, in the first two presentation, but I will come back to, to this point. Um, next slide, uh, please. So the reason why uh, this situation exists is that um, our education system was designed was designed to support uh, the colonial uh, capitalist uh, extractive economies. So some of us must be clerks, others must be geologists, and then there must uh, be uh, accountants. Some could also be pilot. But the pipeline is such that the raw materials, the diamonds are mined in Venetia, in Limpopo. They are taken to Johannesburg, and then from Johannesburg they go to the uh, metropolitan centers, Antwerp, and those other and those other places. So, which knowledge? Who is also um, benefiting uh, from that? Do we have um, any skills to deal with that? So that is part of the of the fundamental uh, problem. So what we are saying in this project then is that um, decolonized knowledge is locally situated both cosmologically, uh, philosophically, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it is also um, world oriented. It is practical, it is relevant, and more importantly, it is problem solving. So what we do then is um, if we solve our own problems uh, on our own terms, we create opportunities for ourselves and not others. So those people in the villages then, why would you then say, oh, I must go to Johannesburg to look for work. I must go to Cape Town to look for work. When you have the resources, when you have um, 
everything around you, it is just that the system that we are dealing with is not conducive to promoting those villages as places for a knowledge production and also as places for um, as, as, as places for uh, engagement. So um, next slide, please. So our research then is um, uh, taking place uh, in uh, this area where um, we have the border between uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa, uh, Botswana and, uh, and Mozambique. So that trans frontier uh, region, part of the Kruger National Park going into, uh, going into Zimbabwe. So that is where the villages um, we are working in are. So at this point then, uh, let me uh, sketch out um, three uh, scenarios. Next uh, slide, uh, please. So um, in terms of the statement of the problem, we have uh, one village um, in uh, southern Zimbabwe. The um, inhabitants, they were traveling about 10 kilometers to access a grinding mill. And when we got there, um, they had spent more than three weeks and uh, waiting for a replacement part uh, from Harare. So the part was simply just um, a metal disc, which if you could drill a hole and just uh, bend it, uh, that could do that could do the job. But they were waiting for that apart from uh, from Harare. Otherwise, uh, they were not going to have um, any any millimeter. Um, ironically, then um, they also exist a significant amount of um, a village science. Um, knowledge of engineering, um, but which is hardly used to uh, confront um, challenges in uh, climate change, in food security, and um, and, and and so on. Um, next slide, please. Nico, are you on the slide with gods and stuff like that? Yes, I am. Ah, okay. That's 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 that, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so this is this just um, um, highlights the contrast between people who have their own knowledge, but for some reason they can't use that knowledge. They are waiting for something to come from um, from Harare, right? That is a problem number one. People have knowledge; they can't use it to solve their problems. They have to wait uh, for solutions from from elsewhere. Case number two. Um, next slide, please. This is a village in Guiani whose name is called uh, Tomo. Um, they are near uh, one of the gates to the Kruger National Park, but they have limited options for participating in the in the tourism. Um, the village has uh, herbal medicine. They produce uh, feminine food. They also have knowledge of chemistry um, and uh, medicines. They have technology. Um, engineering and so on. So the key question then is that is it possible to use this knowledge um, to create opportunities uh, for this um, for the people that live in this uh, in this village? Um, next slide, please. So case number case number three. Um, in all these areas that we have talked about, there are archaeological uh, sites that have a remnants of um, knowledge as set in houses, tools, um, equipment. So the big question then is connecting the uh, past to the to the present. What solutions to contemporary challenges can we uh, learn uh, from this? So our project then um, was aimed at addressing all these uh, all these things to say what can we learn from the present? And what can we learn uh, from the past to ensure that uh, these villages uh, become um, important uh, places for enterprise and um, and knowledge and knowledge production? So, um, slide uh, next slide, please. The key question then: Is it possible to produce uh, usable knowledge uh, from these cases that? Um, that I have uh, that I have highlighted. So this requires a thinking and a doing, as well as a doing and thinking. Um, never, you know, we are that group of scholars that is sort of dissatisfied with um, thinking for thinking's sake, or doing for doing's sake, or just talking 
oh, you know, we have suffered from the colony, we have done this and that, we have done, so what? We need to take practical steps to ensure that um, we reverse uh, the situation. And it is only action um, coupled to thinking and thinking coupled to action that is going to uh, move us uh, forward. Next slide, please. So a key um, element of our approach, just to um, reiterate the point, is that um, fundamental research um, grounds our approach from generating knowledge to, um, its, um, to its application. Uh, next slide, please. So the, this is just a map uh, showing uh, the area. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? This is where Mapungubwe, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and so on are. So one of the projects then was in um, southwestern Zimbabwe, just um, looking at, uh, at the knowledge that people uh, have and the way in which uh, they use it. So as an interdisciplinary team, what we were interested in was to understand uh, their livelihoods um, as well as their adaptation strategies. And the approach that we took was that we formulated some questions in terms of how they approach uh, their everyday. And um, we uh, asked them questions, they gave us answers, we moderated, and then we went back uh, to them uh, for, for validation and so on. So in a way, a kind of uh, a community a peer review of, um, of knowledge. What emerged out of there was quite um, insightful because armed with the knowledge of uh, climate science and so on, you can say that the area is very dry, is very arid and is very marginal. But this community said, no, 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 no. You guys are actually uh, have it uh, wrong. Uh, this is your margin but this is our home and in our home, we have this set of um, adaptations that we use to sustainably live. And some of them said, no, we don't even want to go to, to other areas. This is our home and we, um, we live here in a very, uh, in harmony with, uh, you know, the environment and, and, and everything. So uh, what kind of knowledge do we give these people? Their own understanding of their environment and everything is different to, to ours. So that is a, a problem that we need to, uh, to correct. Uh, next slide, please. So what, what, what they then said was that um, human beings always uh, make a plan and, 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 and um, that knowledge is handed on uh, from, um, from, from different uh, generations. So when we say indigenous knowledge, what is the timeline? What is the historical depth of that indigenous knowledge? That knowledge has changed. Um, so on, and I'm, I'm going to give you an example to illustrate that. Uh, next slide, please. So the other question in terms of core production of knowledge, um, we interviewed oh, 1,200 participants participated in our research. They reviewed uh, the work, they validated it. But the challenge then is um, after this community peer review, do we make all of them 1,200 participants? Do we make them um, co-authors? So there's also something that needs to change in terms of the way in which the uh, publications enterprise is, uh, is organized and so on. Because in terms of ownership, uh, I become a professor, uh, Nomusa becomes a professor, what happens to these uh, communities? Of course, we are producing knowledge that they can use to solve uh, their problems. Uh, next slide, please. So as archaeologists, I asked the question about um, the depth of um, indigenous knowledge and uh, how far back in time does it, uh, does it go? How has it changed? So as archaeologists, um, what we have decided to do, uh, which is also part of uh, a PhD student who was supported by uh, this uh, project, uh, we went to Giani, did some excavations and recovered uh, samples of um, iron, uh, traditional iron, African iron production. And um, we want then to use that as an example of African science and engineering. Uh, next slide, please. So we retrieved um, samples from uh, indigenous uh, or traditional 
or African uh, iron uh, smelting, whatever term, uh, makes you uh, comfortable. So some of those remains include slags and we also have um, finished um, objects. So what we then sought to do was to say, how were these things produced? Because some of that knowledge has uh, since um, uh, disappeared. So we took the remains um, into the archaeology materials um, uh, laboratory at UCT. And if you like toys and gadgets, um, you can look down like what that um, gentleman uh, on the screen is doing. Next uh, slide, please. And this is what you will see. These are microstructures which um, shows uh, the different uh, processes which are the um, those remains have undergone. So you can recreate information on reduction, oxidation, uh, thermodynamics, kinetics, all those um, scientific uh, terms. Yes, they were doing all those things. And here, the time period we are talking about is um, one th around 1200, between 800 AD and 1200 AD. So these are principles of science and so on. They were embedded in the uh, activities which people who were living in current day are in Bopo um, were are doing. Next, place, next slide, please. So what we then did is that through uh, the laboratory uh, study, we managed to recreate the recipe, which are people that live, lived in the long ago are used to produce iron. So with that recipe, we went to collaborate with our um, colleagues, uh, Richard and others, to try and reenact uh, the, uh, the process. Next slide, please. So um, it was a collaborative effort, more men and women involved. We built a furnace. Um, next slide, please. So this is just um, the very stage of loading the furnace. So how it works is that you have a, a charcoal bed and then this is a magnetite uh, at the top and then you pump bellows and then you also put another layer of, uh, of uh, charcoal on top and then you continue to um, to pump at the bellows. So at the beginning, the fire is um, reddish, which is typical of uh, iron uh, dioxide, of carbon dioxide, I beg your pardon. Then um, with time, after about three or so hours, the color of the flame uh, changes to uh, greenish, uh, bluish, um, which is typical of uh, carbon monoxide. So that is normally uh, the indicator that um, the smelting is uh, is done because you are not seeing uh, the reactions from from outside, but by uh, monitoring the color of the of the flames, you can know uh, when to uh, stop uh, the uh, the process. Next slide, please. So this is just a slide show showing you uh, what was uh, what was happening. Next slide, please. And uh, yeah, there were also happy moments. This man uh, that was his PhD, so I'm sure. That's why is that's Eric Mato, uh, the lecturer in the University of uh, of Venda. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, documentation uh, processes uh, to ensure that we record everything for, uh, for 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 replication. And here we have um, our colleagues um, Simon Hall in the archaeology, Per Ditlev, University of Oslo, and um, and others. Next slide, please. So um, after about um, uh, three hours, and it's pretty uh, labor, labor, labor intensive. But yeah, you get uh, a fitness uh, in the in the process. Next slide, please. Um, then we uh, had to uh, stop that. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is um, at the base of the furnace. That's a mass of um, uh, reduced iron, uh, some charcoal. As well as the as well as the slag. Next slide, please. So that's a typical what is known as a typical uh, iron bloom uh, from the from the furnace. Uh, next slide, please. So we then had to uh, collapse everything, uh, take uh, out uh, the um, iron, uh, consolidate it. I'm not showing here it here. Um, then we took uh, those remains. Uh, back to the uh, laboratory at um, at UCT. Next slide, please. Then we started um, the remains uh, using the same uh, techniques, and um, in the process, we were able to produce uh, secular uh, knowledge, and that then to us proved that um, this process of um, uh, African iron smelting 
we can uh, reenact it. So had it not been for COVID, our plan was to have uh, rolled out uh, the first exercise with uh, our colleagues um, in uh, in Tomo village. So to see how uh, the uh, the tourists in the Kruger uh, can um, respond uh, to that uh, cultural um, activity. That was also going to be tied to you know, Musa's idea of having um, a festival of uh, arts and, uh, and, and, and heritage. And in the process also, uh, try and see if youth cannot be uh, employed uh, in, all, uh, in all this. Next slide, please. So um, just to uh, mention that alongside this usable knowledge, that we were able to, um, uh, to, to, to generate. The next uh, phase, hoping that the public health situation improves, is also to have um, a Limpopo Youth um, Art and Heritage Festival tied into that smelting um, event, and also thinking about borders, conservation, and knowledge creation. An important part of all this is that um, even African smelting is associated with the use of medicines and, and so on. So Collect Andara's work then um, has generated some insights into traditional precision uh, herbal medicine. And he's also thinking about um, what might be the nature and form of uh, a traditional pharmacies, given that people rely on um, herbal medicine in that part of the part of the world. So um, we 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 were going forward. Um, these are the kinds of things that we will have done this year. But hopefully, uh, next year we might be able to uh, focus on them. Next slide, please. So um, we supported um, three PhD students, one master's students, eight peer-reviewed publications, one a book uh, published by Routledge. Um, it's a very cheap book, uh, pre-publication price of. Uh, 120 pounds. Uh, if you don't get it before 1 November, then that will uh, go up to um, 140 pounds. Uh, we also have uh, two books uh, in preparation and with also the uh, publishing contracts in hand. Next slide, please. Shadrach, we'll need to go to questions quite soon. Thank you. Uh, I'm wrapping up. Thanks for that. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? OK. So what we have done, um, no, no, even the next one is fine. So what we have done with all this knowledge then is, um, I mentioned at the beginning that um, our idea was to try and ensure that um, this uh, project uh, generates um, something that is uh, sustainable. So we have um, aligned uh, these uh, research themes um, to, for example, the university's uh, the vision and so on. Can I have the next slide, please? So what we have then done is to uh, mobilize uh, support within UCT and outside of it. And some of those projects that I mentioned, we then placed them into an envelope of uh, a UCT um, heritage hub. We are busy consulting with um, uh, the executive and other people for signing. But the idea is that out of this project is going to come out um, a facility for decolonial research, uh, for inter faculty research, and also for inter institutional uh, teaching. We have some courses that we have already developed that are having about uh, eight universities um, are involved. And one of the research streams is going to be the uh, Global South uh, Cosmologies. Next slide, please. Hopefully, the last one. So, we are also going to be having um, field schools next year. We have secured this money from uh, private donors. So the, invest, the initial investment from UCT has resulted in um, interest from other people. So those are the people who are behind um, the funding of the UCT Heritage Hub with the decoloniality as one of the guiding um, uh, principles. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the people that have bought into um, the vision of the of the Heritage Hub and uh, starting from the that seed which has generated uh, this uh, forest. If there are donors out there, you are also welcome to put in your money. You will be in a good company, I can assure you. Um, next slide, please. So is this sustainable? Is this too good to be true? Yes, we have um, some uh, memorandum draft, memorandum of agreements and so on if they are signed. 
we are ready to go. Uh, last slide, please. This is Heritage Month. So if what I was saying sounds too good to be true, then there is an answer from uh, Bob Mali, and uh, time will tell. But um, I would like to end by wishing you all a happy uh, Heritage uh, Month. Thank you. Thanks very much, Shadrach. That was a great presentation and lovely, lovely work. I love the way it cross cuts everything that we do in uh, all the different areas of the uh, executive's portfolios at the university. It's brilliant. Um, I'd like to uh, go into there are quite a lot of questions to be asked. I'd like to start by something which was coming up at the end of the talk before you, which was around how decolonial thought seemed to be um, uh, focused in social, political and humanities at UCT. Well, I think you've changed some of those thoughts, but maybe I'd like to just talk a little bit more uh, from, from your perspective of how we can decolonize science, engineering and the built environment as well. Um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, the key thing then is uh, for us, uh, from our point of view, de it depends on how you, you define decolonization. For us, decolonization is all about producing knowledge that is usable and that you can produce um, so solutions. So if we uh, use that definition, then what we all we need to do is to break uh, the disciplinary silos and, 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 and then say, well, what is wrong with um, uh, engineers uh, working with uh, anthropologists or anthropologists working with uh, medical geneticists? We have a problem of, uh, of health. How do we make herbal medicine safe? Then archaeologists and, 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 and pharmacologists uh, need to work together and, 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 and you know, uh, develop protocols that make that uh, medicine safe. That is decolonial uh, knowledge, decolonial uh, research uh, for us. These things of talking to say decolonize A, decolonize B, it is a conversation that has uh, great depth. You know, W.E.B. Du Bois, we're talking about that. Um, Googie in the 1960s, what came out of that beyond talk? It's, it's good to have a good conceptual, uh, conceptual understanding of things, but it is also good to have a good handle on application. So is it possible to swing de uh, decolonization from talk into doing <laughs> and with uh, all hands being put onto the deck? Great, that's a, that's a great way of, of focusing us. Um, you you referred to this while you were talking. It, uh, Uvania says it's important to recognize and give credit to indigenous teachers and authors so that we do not exploit them as free labor by mining them for data. How do we substantively do this? You began to refer to that, but I think it would be great to talk a bit more about it. Yes, and uh, so co-production of knowledge, uh, co-publication, is uh, one way in which uh, a number of colleagues uh, have been, even at UCT, June Baum and colleagues, um, they have been, uh, yeah, Rachel Weinberg and so on, they've been working on these uh, co-production of, uh, co of knowledge. But the problem is, uh, or the challenge, not a problem, the challenge is that um, the, our goals and aims as academics, for me, it is to produce, sometimes it is to produce an academic paper, it goes into a high impact journal. The next thing I put in my papers for promotion, I'm a professor, right? Is that the same goal that the communities that we are working with in Guiani, is that their goal as well? Their goal is to ensure that next time when their grinding mill um, breaks down, they should be able to find a local way of, of solving that problem. So how do we ensure then that the knowledge that we generate is problem solving because that is what people are interested in. Even if we go back to um, some theories such as uh, Amilka Cabral, there is that famous quote um, where he said that um, uh, it, it is important to bear in mind that people are not fighting for the things in anyone's head. You know, they are fighting, you know, they are not fighting for ideas, but to get, you know, material benefits and to live peaceably. So how do we ensure that knowledge contributes to, to solutions? If we are solving the problems in Limpopo and so on, that is more important. We can have a win-win situation. Academics have papers. The communities have solutions to, to order and, and, and so on. That is how I see it. Great. 
Thank you very much. And that's, that aligns with the anonymous's question. Uh, 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 Professor Chikorera's uh, presentation is the first to show actual decolonization research in practice. I'd like to hear more on his thoughts about thinking doers and doer thinkers, because we need more doers. I'm not sure whether you'd like to say more, you'd just like to take that as a comment. Um, OK, <laughs> just just to say by using that phrase, it is just uh, acknowledging the fact that sometimes there is uh, a recursive relationship between thinking and doing and also right. doing Thanks. and thinking which is why we had to go into the field, get samples, validate those um, in the uh, in the lab and then go and apply and then go and validate again. That's, that, that, that is that process where you get uh, practical knowledge, which is also testing in a way. Great, thank you. Um, uh, pre a question which came up again across the presentations. Um, I'd like to see a closer formal alliance between de decolonial scholarship in Africa and open ac and the open access movement. This would help to erode some of the elitism and managerialism that is pervasive in South African academia. Um, would you like to comment on open access and its role in, in your work? Uh, yes, uh, so the normally um, again, we can go back to the, uh, the, the the way in which the publications field is uh, is, is configured. Um, so some uh, grant. Uh, so if you get a funding from the European Union, everything that you publish has to be open access. So that is that that is there. That is their pre that is their precondition. So just to say that to enable open access, um, it requires uh, money. But the key question is. We can also self-publish and make it available, you know, for example, on blogs and and, and other and other public platforms. So we are working with filmmakers. I mentioned uh, Simon Bright. I mentioned the award-winning, um, yeah, who actually has a very nice movie on Netflix, uh, Eken Esom, uh, who is um, also a lecturer in film and media at Pan-African University in, in Nigeria. So they also participated in our, they participate in our work. So our idea then is to ensure that this knowledge is uh, available outside the academy, outside the mainstream, and by going into film uh, and other multimedia platforms. The other thing that we wanted to do is to also have um, live streamed lectures. So when we are in Guyana next time, can we have people in class at UCT watching what is happening in the in the village and then so on, and also having the all the villagers getting you know so open access yes um we are doing that but uh, rather slowly our book what do science um technology and innovation mean from africa was published open access by mit press so it is uh, publicly available but we need to do more beyond open access there are these um conventional so development of apps can we do that to ensure that we spread um our knowledge uh, widely and uh, wildly perhaps Right, thank you. I'm just going to bring up two questions as uh, as the last of our space. I'm sorry we ha don't have much time for question and answer here, um, and let you respond to them together. So the first comes from Sally, and it's how quickly does indigenous knowledge become exploitable by those who are more powerful once a market is established for it, and how do we stop this from happening? And then the second question is. Um, Actually, I want to throw three into the mix here. <laughs> the second is human beings always make a plan unless they've been persuaded that they cannot. Um, I believe colonialism and other isms have disempowered people. Your comment, please. And then going back to the products, how do we enable village based products and services to serve as in the mainstream community? Uh, like, for instance, certain tools or building structures, medicines, foods need to be certified by different institutions institutions for security and safety uh, reasons. So how do the village products become mainstreamed? So maybe you could end up with dealing with those three um, for us. Thanks, Shadrach. The advantage of being asked many questions is you choose the easiest one. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, starting with the validation, certification and so on. So that's why our project is uh, established as a collaboration. So Professor Dandara has a laboratory uh, in the Faculty of Health Sciences, 
where they have been doing uh, a lot of experiments in uh, ethnopharmacology. They have been looking at herbal medicine, uh, finding active ingredients, determining what is the appropriate dose. So once you have, you can say, if you weigh, for example, some roots from, uh, from a shrub, you know that one kilogram is enough to give you the required dose to cure a cough. In other words, that's what he's doing. So we are already we are already working on uh, on that. So making other things uh, available on mainstream, there is a combination of uh, of marketing. So we have to market. That's why, and you also have to work with others. That's why we are working with South African National Parks. That's why we are also working with other tourism uh, promoters to ensure that that uh, becomes uh, mainstream. Marketing is is very powerful. Believe me. Then human beings always make a plan. Yes, 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 yes. That is the good thing about um, promoting enterprise and promoting um, uh, initiative. Just that there is also need for policy. So Sherry Augusto worked, is a, worked with the African Union to promote uh, education and policy in Africa. That's why we have here in our project, because there has to be a coherent and consistent policy which says that, look, let us ensure that these villages benefit from this knowledge and and this is how this is going to um, to work so that will address the current uh, caveat associated with uh, indigenous knowledge you know everyone says it but everyone has not demonstrated how that can work in practice in practice it ends up being a talk show and talk shows are not um, satisfactory i'm not good at them would rather leave them to oprah winfrey thank you Thanks. Thanks very much, Shadrach. Um, and thanks for a lovely talk. We're going to move on now to our panel discussion. And for that, I'd like to introduce uh, Loretta Ferris, needs no introduction, our DVC Transformation, who will be the moderator of the panel. Loretta, it's over to you. Thank you, Sue. I think the previous session has wonderfully set us up for, for this moderator discussion. Um, so with that, let me say good afternoon to everyone. And without further ado, and in the interest of time, let me introduce you to the panel. The panel, my, my introductions will be short because we will post the, the bio, uh, bios in the Q&A section. Um, but today, who's joining us on the panel um, are four renowned scholars who works in this area of, of decolonization. Alawani Ramagundo um, is a professor of occupational therapy at UCT. She was also co chair 2016 to 2017 of the Curriculum Change Working Group. Um, and then she's joined by Rebecca Ackerman, who is the director of the Human Evolution Research Institute, and um, she's professor professor in the Department of Archaeology, and she's also deputy dean of Transformation. Um, then we have Dr. June Bam Hutchinson. She's the interim head of the newly launched um, Sun and Koi unit. It was launched yesterday. And she works in, in um, the African diaspora in heritage. And she was also, of course, leading the work um, with the Sara Restorative Justice Forum in the renaming of, of Sara Bartman. Then finally, Dr. Kasturi Bihari Leek is a senior lecturer at UCT, and she's also the interim director of the, of the Academic Staff and Professional Development Center um, in the Center for Higher um, Education Development Chair here at UCT um, and president of the Higher Education Learning and Teaching Association of, of South Africa. So, and, and her interest is, is in um, decoloniality as it relates to pedagogy. Now, the, the big question today for, for the panelists are to, to think about how do we take this work that we are doing with respect to decolonization, whether it's in the curriculum, whether it's through our research, whether it's through our engagement with the communities, how do we embed it in Vision 2030? Um, and how do we take on the challenge um, to also embed decoloniality as we unleash human potential for a fair and just society? So let me hear from the panelists. Um, Alawani, do you maybe want to start by just sharing some of your initial thoughts with us? Alawani? Okay, um, th 
Thank you, um, Professor Ferris. Um, so I think I want to start by commending our colleagues um, who presented their work. Um, Professor uh, Floretta Bonsai, Associate Professor Shose Kesi, Professor Shadrach Chirukure, Dr. Loazi, uh, Lushaba, uh, uh, Ms. Yanda. Um, it really, I think, must be um, also um, commended uh, of the DVC uh, research portfolio um, for having made funding available uh, for this um, level of uh, scholarship uh, to have emerged. Um, I think it shows that uh, if you want to see good work, you must invest in it. And, and to, to have seen uh, such excellent scholarship and decolonial uh, uh, scholarship at that is, is very encouraging. Um, and I think for me, what is particularly um, uh, encouraging is the fact that postgraduate students uh, wanting to do, to do decolonial work and, and research uh, find a home uh, in those spaces that these colleagues uh, are leading. And I had the pleasure of engaging some of them at the inaugural uh, 2020 UCT Decolonial Summer School. And uh, it's, it's really um, something that I think if we are serious about advancing decolonial research, uh, we, we, we ought to do more um, to, to, to make sure that uh, the next generation of, of scholars uh, are, are able to find uh, places that nature uh, their thinking and growth. Um, and I think what it also says is that decolonization was never a fad. Uh, it wasn't something that uh, just popped up uh, in 2015, 2016 to fizzle out with time, but it was really a resurgence, a, a call um, from our students and, 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 and staff to say, we've got unfinished business here. Um, it, it is time to return to those important questions around what decolonization and decoloniality uh, actually mean and, and what we are hoping to see uh, within the academy. But of course, in doing such work, uh, one needs to be brave. Um, brave as an individual, the academy, uh, uh, in, in, in um, indicating that decolonization and decoloniality uh, are taken seriously, uh, open uh, uh, itself to critique and, and useful critique. Um, one uh, such uh, source of critique that I think uh, where, you know, the, the critique is precise. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's by Tang and, and Yang. Um, really just saying that decolonization ought to be unsettling. Um, it should be unsettling because it really ought to bring about the repatriation of indigenous land and life. That decolonization is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies and schools. So basically, people who continue to be marginalized, saying it's, it's not enough that you advance your scholarship. It's not enough that you become professors uh, through what you call decolonial work, uh, but that if access to land is still not realized for sustenance in terms of food security, in terms of spiritual sustenance, then we have not begun to engage with the real issues before us. And of course, when you talk about access to land, you're also talking about access or adequate uh, access to housing for our society and for um, you know people like me who are in the health sciences. Um, these are important questions because if our societies are not benefiting fully from what we are calling decolonial research and scholarship, um, then we will continue. Um, to face upheaval and we will continue to um, receive this critique. I'll stop there for now so that others can have an opportunity.
Thank you, Wani. I want to go to Kastudi next. Um, do you maybe want to, to share your, your initial thinking, Kastudi? Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. Um, I want to also start off by acknowledging the great work that was presented this morning and to acknowledge the great work that is happening in various parts of UCT um, on the theme of decoloniality in the project in trying to bring about change that is necessary um, and, and something that was born out of real struggle uh, long before 2015, 2016. In thinking about Vision 2030 through a decolonial lens, there are specific discourses um, that provide some resonance and links. For example, the central tenet of Vision 2030 states, UCT is a global university in Africa unleashing human potential to create a fair and just society. Uh, by foregrounding Africa, human potential and just society, um, they are common departure points from a decolonial perspective. Reclaiming the land and the continent, Africa, reasserting who is human, who is considered human, and working towards justice are important um, aspects of decoloniality. The big challenge is how to unpack this vision using a decolonial attitude and to translate this into meaningful praxis in the areas of teaching and learning, research, social responsiveness and so on. And I think that is the work we are charged to do. The RMF and FMF movements in 2015 brought decoloniality into focus in South Africa and for South Africa. I say South Africa because decoloniality was underway and is underway in other parts of the world, such as New Zealand with the Maori, First Nations in Canada, South America, Indian and uh, India and other parts of Africa. Recently, in the Black Lives Matter and the I Can't Breathe movement, and in South Africa with the Clicks advert, we know that coloniality is always bubbling under the surface. Decolonial scholar Lewis Gordon points out that the irony shouldn't be lost on us between these movements and COVID-19, both being respiratory diseases resulting in fatalities around the world. So until we deal with coloniality in our classrooms and the university, and beyond the university, we might not be truly free to envision a future that can be just and fair. I want to offer six motifs uh, that will attempt to bring Vision 20 into conversation with decoloniality and teaching and learning. The first one is where we teach matters. So context is key. Vision 2030 focuses on Africa and it draws attention to the spelling of Africa with a K to reclaim Africa's agency. So I think reclaiming space and place, which were key commodities displaced through colonization, is central to decoloniality. How have our contexts conditioned us and limited or enabled us to grow as people? The second is who teaches matters. By understanding our positionality, identity and agency, we should strive to avoid reinforcing unequal power dynamics through race and gender in the classroom and use feminist sensibilities to stop reproducing existing patriarchy, privilege and other gaps. The third is what we teach matters. The issue of curriculum is key, as are the issues of the history of the canon and the disciplines. And in the late Harry Garuba's words, what has been disciplined in and out of epistemologies to produce epistemic injustices? Whose story gets told? Who is acknowledged? Who isn't? These are all issues of curation and representation via the curriculum, which we need to tackle head on. The fourth is why we teach matters. And this brings into focus our ethics, our values and our gravitas. Vision 2030 states that redressing inequality will have the effect of restoring dignity. Indeed, reflection and recalibration of our practice, in Ngugi's words, by remembering and reasserting our voice is an act of social corrective and restorative justice in itself. 
Number five, how we teach matters. So the issue of what we teach and how we teach are intertwined in complex ways. DVC Lunger calls for transformative pedagogies in Vision 2030. And indeed, we need to facilitate classroom engagements, virtual or otherwise, that inspire participation and confidence among all students. We need to disrupt existing patterns of dominance by restructuring the classroom conversation. Black academics at UCT have proposed approaches such as social pedagogies, which we need to explore. And the last one is who we are counts. This is an issue of legitimacy. We have to find ways to ensure that all voices are heard and are important, but we need to bring into balance the silence and marginalized voices as well. We need to decenter the teacher's voice and enable students to contribute and shape their own thinking and being. So Vision 2030 is indeed a balancing act. How do we do the reparation work that is needed and still innovate and remain relevant in current times and in the future? Vision 2030 provides a great future orientation to drive our thinking around excellence, transformation and sustainability. But from a decolonial lens, in preparing the future ready and not future proof graduate, we would have to ask whose future, which graduate? Does future ready include being, uh, include having respect for humanity, sustainability, inclusion, social justice, and so on? What does future ready mean in the pandemic? How do we learn from a future that is emerging right now before us in the present? Perhaps we need to think about the future in the plural. The future might not be one common reality for all in the global north and south. We should make changes that resonate with us and inspire us and are driven by great moral ethic about what is just and what is fair. Thank you, Loretta. Thank you very much, Kasturi. Um, Becky, I want to go to you and, and I want you to share, I want you, I, I want you to share with us your thoughts on, on how we're taking decoloniality forward in Vision 2030. Thanks, Loretta. And again, thanks to all the, the panel speakers and everyone who, who has, has participated in this. Um, so I wanted to speak to this quite personally, you know, as both a scientist uh, and as a white person. You know, I know that many people in my world uh, are quite put off by the term decolonization or decoloniality. And I also know people who look at science um, as pure and not in need of decolonization. So I think one important point, part of decolonization is for everyone to recognize that there's a problem that needs fixing. Um, for white people, it means owning your privilege and owning your role in maintaining and, and reproducing colonial dynamics. Um, that's part of it. Um, acknowledging that people with other characteristics were devalued in a colonial context, that that remains so today. Um, the people have had very different lived experience, of course, it's all part of it. And I think examining your science uh, very carefully is also part of it. You know, this involves a lot of listening, uh, self-reflection, self-education, um, and a lot of critical reflection on your discipline. So, you know, kind of coming to some examples, you know, for me as a, as a white woman born in the U.S. who's been in South Africa for two decades, um, decolonization kind of means understanding how I've benefited uh, tremendously from the networks and opportunities that I had in my life um, into my research career, um, including as a foreigner who benefited from accessing African heritage in particular, things like fossils, because I'm a paleoanthropologist, um, realizing that many students here haven't had these same opportunities um, as a direct consequence of this legacy of settler colonialism, and then kind of actively working to stitch black and female postgraduates into these academic networks so that they have the opportunities but i think even more importantly making sure that you do it in a way that their voices are kind of centered and valued and um, this is especially true if they're taking on decolonizing research such as ziana was was alluding to you know it, they can be quite alienated even if you get them in those networks in the first place so you really have to provide an extra level of, of support there um so for me as a biological anthropologist or a paleoanthropologist, you know, decolonization means 
in this in this emerging context means owning things. It means owning the fact that my discipline has a dark history of racism and of othering and body collection of black and brown people were part of that. And that that history, again, in this context of settler colonialism, and I should say both in, in this country and in, in the country of my birth, has shaped the legacy of, of my discipline right up to today. And so you have to teach and you have to have conversations about that history. You have to talk about the black people and the women who are marginalized in the making of that history. You have to talk about race and what it is and how it's a social construct. And these, all of these discussions can act to kind of destabilize and um, recenter the discourse as Kasturi was just outlining. And also taking on research that um, challenges Ra racialized, gendered, colonial narratives such as um, exist in human origins research, so in my work, and also kind of reaches outside of the ivory tower for knowledge generation, as Shadrach was saying. And I was really struck by um, Shosi's comments about pathologizing individuals. You know, this has been a common thing in my discipline, um, whether literally like pathologizing fossils in order to dismiss them from the narratives because of it doesn't fit within a, a narrative, or um, whether you pathologize or um, dismiss individuals to, to shut down their voices. It, it has been a theme. And then finally, I just wanted to say for me as a scientist more generally, um, decolonization means valuing diversity in research, right? Valuing the work, the, re the actual research that's showing that diverse and intersectional teams produce better science because they've got this rich, complex, heterogeneity of thinking and practice. And then, you know, working to make sure that spaces in my discipline and in my faculty are more diverse so that knowledge production is in everybody's hands, as people have been talking about, you know, and, and the result of that is actually that we produce better science um, through valuing that diversity and intersectionality. So thanks. Um, sorry, I was struggling to unmute. Um, Toon, um, do you want to go ahead and, and share your thoughts? Yeah, um, thank you everyone. Thank you esteemed colleagues. Um, it's a real pleasure listening to you this morning and thank you also for the acknowledgement um, from Shadrick for our work and the DVC's um, transformation research teaching and learning and the vice chancellor for supporting our work. And um, so um, what I'm going to say in informing Vision 2030 is really out of a very practical example of work on the ground with the Tara restorative justice that informs what the, the speakers said this morning and drawing out what could have uh, could be um, verified in terms of all these processes and unleashing human potential to come up with innovative um, uh, solutions together that will bring about a just and fair society. And so um, in this work, um, as the work that Shadrick is doing and the things that um, Loz, um, Loaz has been speaking about and, and Jose, is this real and getting into these models that are not deficit models to start off with. We've got alternatives and these alternatives need to inform Vision 2030 and working with, as we did with the Tara Restorative Justice Forum, uh, workers, civic activists, the unemployed, the people that uh, people are scared to work with. Those are the real people. When we speak about uh, justice, we need to get to work with the people, the majority of people and their languages, multilingualism, extremely important, interdisciplinarity. There's no way you can get through um, within the disciplines in addressing um, decoloniality and decolonizing and the, the very act of deco uh, decoloniality. So there is the um, so, so symbiotic relationship of the two. Um, it cannot exist the one without the other. And we found this with our work with the um, with the community group of uh, civic associations and that and um, it's about co-design, co-publishing, co-authoring and benefits going back and even looking at recognition of prior learning as very, very important in growing that cohort of scholars from communities on real issues uh, that make a difference in communities um, and the research ethics that are very central to that. So the concept of something like uh, Twaba, uh, Twaba Tans, uh, 
uh, Knowing on the Wind, it's not just a metaphor, it's really about validating, theorizing um, uh, uh, knowledges that have been on the periphery, people with those archives on the periphery. And this is not just humanities. We're talking science, mathematics. Um, those are all storing. Um, epistemologies are forms of storing across the disciplines, across the faculties, across the canons. And so if we get out of that capture as well of how we see these epistemologies as only storing in the humanities, I think then we can start in that interdisciplinarity within this um, vision that we have for the future in these uh, decolonizing our teaching, our pedagogies, and how we look at knowledges and storing as narratives. So I won't keep it be long because I can see that the time is going and um, uh, uh, there must be questions um, to be addressed. But just to say that it's disruptive, it's disobedience, it's very difficult. We've worked for, uh, in our situation, for over a hundred hours of um, intense workshop and deep listening. It's um, uncomfortable for both the community partners and for us because we're all in this process of what that means in disrupting our own comforts, our own assumptions, our own assumed truths um, within an African philosophy. And so what does that mean in the everyday when one has to do that to validate these knowledges as theory and as valid of interpretation and at the center? And Vision 2030 should be one that takes into account this bigger ecology of decoloniality as Coloniality is an ecology, of course, on the dark side. So what is that light side? Thank you. Thank you, June. I, I think that uh, through through the, the inputs, we've heard some, some interesting themes. Um, I've, I've heard themes around reclaiming, reclaiming pedagogy, the archive, reclaiming heritage, um, reclaiming voice. Uh, reclaiming land, reclaiming the continent, um, whilst at the same time, as Becky reminds us, being mindful of, of also owning the, the dark sides of the history. But on this notion of, of reclaiming continent, which, which came through a couple of, 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 of the inputs, there's a question that asks, why does Vision 2030 frame UCT as a global university in Africa? Why not an African university? Are we not an African university? Does this language of distancing not defeat the decolonial imperative? So I want each um, of, of the presenters to, to just give, give their, their view on this. And, and unfortunately, due to the time constraints, this will be the, the one and only question. Um, so I'm going to start with, with June, um, you, you know, your, your view on this, on this question. So know, sorry, Lorita. Can you just repeat it for me, please? I'm terribly sorry. So, so the question is, why does Vision 2030 frame UCT as a global university in Africa? Why not an African university? Are we not an African university? And that's the language of distancing, not to keep the decolonial imperative. Yeah, I think it's 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 very important to 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 in grounding the Africans of our university and it is an African university. Um, um, it's very important also to look at Africa, not just as, um, you know, uh, uh, within the area study kind of discourse, but rather within the you know, we've worked with beyond the frontiers of the nation state. We've got an ancient history um, as African people um, within the Afri and also con uh, consolidated within the African diaspora. So, um, and uh, to be part of, of an ancient global world. So, while we're also an African university, first and foremost, African university in Africa, we're also part of a big global world in which Africa has had a very central an important role to play in what we have today as global capitalism. So I think um, we shouldn't negate that very important place of Africa in the world as an African university um, and working beyond the frontiers. Thank you, June. 
So Becky, um, why are we not an African university but in Vision 2030, but a global university in Africa? I liked um, June's answer as someone who studies human origins research, right? Africa is in a sense, in a sense, uh, you know, the beginning of all things, right? It is global kind of by its, its, uh, by its history. You know, I, I'll take us back to the thing I was saying at the end. I, I think that um, we want to be as heterogeneous as possible in our thinking and practice. And so we want to kind of center Africa as a global space, but also claim this ability to produce um, global, heterogeneous, um, complex thinking, complex practice that's going to shape the world, as you will. So I, I think it's important for us to embrace that globalness, you know, and embrace the the role that Africa has to play in, in creating that sort of heterogene heterogeneity of knowledge. Um, to be able to produce better knowledge, to be able to produce better science in, in the case of the disciplines that I'm in. But I think it's much more broad than that. Thank you, Becky. Um, Kasturi, your views? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. I think it's a really important question because it surfaces the very tension that we have to work through. So I'm not offering a solution. I am suggesting that the tension between being globally relevant um, and locally authentic, that is the decolonial work we need to do. I think that even though we are showcasing in a sense the work at UCT, we also need to understand that UCT is not an island unto itself. There are 25 other universities in the country that we need to, you know, demonstrate a relational sort of um, ontology with. How are we growing together as part of South Africa into Africa? But unlike perhaps the other universities, UCT being a traditional research intensive university for all these years has, in a sense, been leaning on a northern, um, you know, whether it's epistemologies or pedagogies, etc. And I think it makes sense that as we recenter and reclaim and remove that these these two uh, concepts are always in tension. So it's a work in progress. Thank you, Kasturi. Elowani, you have the final word on this question. <laughs> Trust Loretta to do that to me. Uh, I think it's a brilliant question. I think what it does is that it pushes us as UCT to reckon with the fact that we may be ambivalent about our Africanness. And perhaps as we think about a university a global university which finds itself in Africa, we ought to ask ourselves, what do we mean by global? You know, do we mean the whole world with everyone in it? Or are we talking about a slice of the global? You know, the question around classists, university, elitists, um, universities, when we talk about global, to what extent are we resisting that allure, that attraction to a global that leave many behind. And I think we ought to ask ourselves very difficult question about on whose behalf we speak. So when we say we are an African university, are we including in that conception of a university someone from Nyanga, Bon de Yevel, Bishop's Levis, Guguletu, Soweto, are, are they part of this African um, that we are conceptualizing and to which we aspire um, as a university to see more of? Or are we going to find ourselves with Vision 2030 seeing less of exactly those people that would want to call this their university too? So the vice chancellor right at the beginning uh, refer to a question that Maldonado Torres asks 
You know, what would knowledge look like if produced from the perspective of the colonized? And I think it's a very important to, question to keep going back to and to ask ourselves the question further, to what extent do our students and researchers ask questions that stare them, that emanate from the concerns confronting their communities instead of finding themselves complicit in what drives coloniality and eventually death. So, I mean, COVID-19 has been such an important time for us to learn and be reminded of serious issues that we face, not only in South Africa, but in other contexts that are like ourselves, the US in particular. And sometimes we've been having to think um, about why around COVID-19, some of our research tended to be obituaristic, you know, announcing on death rather than focusing on what needs to be done to support indigenous approaches to preventing ill health and death. And, and some of our politicians picking up on that and you know, being in haste to dig graves. So, I mean, it's, it's, we, we have to contend with this question about what do we mean when we say African? To what extent do people in our locales, in our communities, can um, identify with this university that we love and that we want to see uh, continuing to thrive. And I think the questions that we ask must not only just highlight the why, but also a deep analysis on how things came to be what they currently are. And, and Ramon Grossfugel has this important thing to say about questions, you know, the questions we ask, they must allow us to take a long durée view of history. So for instance, it's very easy to say, why is it that so-and-so do not participate so fully within the academy? But if we don't ask the question, when, how, and why, <laughs> you know, so for instance, regarding the Eurocentric um, academic project, if we ask the question, how come, you know, or when, how, and why did five white men of five countries, Britain, Germany, France, USA, and Italy, come to be centered? so heavily in Western epistemology. Then you begin to uncover the genocide and the epistemicide, the epistemicide that accompanied coloniality. So you don't, you, don't, you don't put a veneer over a, an ugly history and present the current as if it happened um, by itself. And, then, and, and, and lastly, I think the idea of the African university speaks to a theme that kept, re, you know, coming back over and over right from, right from the beginning when we started with the webinar for language. To what extent are we embracing languages from this continent? When we call it an African university, to what extent are we centering African languages in any of our projects? Are we really going to just be comfortable with multilingualism? <laughs> we still, doesn't have the courage to center for a change, any of our African languages. And I think that's something that we need to think about. And also in terms of what we invest in as research projects that will see us um, be convincing when we engage those others that we often leave behind as we go global. Thank you. Thank you, Alwani. Um, I, I think that's a very important challenge that you that you leave us with as we move forward um, and, and, the, and implementing this vision that we have set for ourselves. Um, I want to give over to Liz now to um, give her reflection on the conversations that we have, but I want to thank our panelists. I, I wish we had more time. I think this was such a such a rich conversation. Um, and so I want to thank you for your contributions um, this afternoon. Liz, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, the, 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 the task of having to synthesize the thinking of 
all of you, plus the contribution that our colleagues have made in relation to the research projects is very daunting. But it's been a fantastic discussion, so thank you. Thank you very, very much for your for your contributions. Um, I, I would like to start with 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 something that that both Enelwani and 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 Loasi said, and it is this notion that, in the same way that coloniality was not uh, uh, just a a a, a, a sort of a military invasion but a, but an intellectual project the coloniality is of course an intellectual project but i would like to reverse this thing the coloniality is also a political project it is an emancipatory project that needs to respond to the reality of the injustices and inequalities etc uh, that that were produced by the by the colonial encounter and by the and, and by the settlement uh, of the of the colonization. So in this sense, uh, 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 what the, the quote that Lelwani put across that, that that the coloniality is not a metaphor uh, is fundamental in the in the thinking and in the putting together of Vision 2030, because Vision 2030 is not a pie dream. Is, is a response to the reality in which we find ourselves and a commitment to shape a future that has certain ethical characteristics uh, and therefore a particular intellectual outlook. So, and I think that that's, that's very uh, important in the contributions that all panel members made. Uh, our colleagues presenting their research and our colleagues discussing now uh, Vision 2030 uh, per se. So that's the one, the one issue. The other issue that we have been discussing up to now is how everybody has agreed on the need to reclaim and understand what the reclaiming means. Mm -hmm. Our African, the, the, the African roots of this university uh, and its insertion in the in the continent. Of course, of course, as 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 it has been agreed. This university, as much as the disciplines that we that we teach, has a dark history in many respects that associates it with 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 the colonial uh, regime, with with sort of lukewarm approaches and 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 stance in relation to some aspects of apartheid, and all of that is acknowledged uh, as as things that we need to step on in order. To, to come into the future and as also present in the in the in, in vision 2030. One of the interesting things and I think that we all are agreeing in this regard is is the need to switch from Africa's colonial position to affirm Africa's capacity to contribute to the world. Uh, and this is one possible reading of the global uh, African uh, an African uh, university is also a global university. I, I think that Castur is absolutely spot on in terms of the contradictions and the tensions that we need to hold together and how those contradictions manifest themselves. Uh, the issue of, as much as we are working on it, it's still work in progress, the issue of multilingualism and, 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 and how multilingualism sort of works on the, on the edge uh, still of, um, of a sort of bold affirmation of, of African languages as, as defining of a particular ontology. Um, the other issue that everybody has agreed on is our capacity to create knowledge that takes the, discipl the disciplines as canon to task and engages with them deeply uh, in the manner in which we teach, in the manner in which we present ourselves to our students and how uh, and this goes in relation to what uh, also uh, Becky and, 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 and Dr. Lushava said. Uh, the, the notion that we need to create knowledge by engaging with a generation of creating a new generation of academics, creating knowledge from the theoretical level up. And uh, how does that take place? I mean, Joseph. And, and, and Shadrach produced some very interesting examples of multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and, and, and transdisciplinarity as ways of approaching knowledge. 
and, and as ways that not just sort of do away with, with silos that exist in the academia, but also that recognize a different way of existence that it is possible. I think that um, the, the, the other issue that has been mentioned, and, and June mentioned it, and Elwani mentioned it, and Shadrach mentioned it, and, 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 and in a sense, everybody is very aware of this, is how the relationship between the university and the society within which it operates, the immediate society, uh, uh, of the, the immediate context of the university becomes part of the university. How do we produce knowledge democratically? This is what, what Vision 2030 is looking for in terms of insisting not only on the on the on the on the university leading in thinking but also leading in terms of transformation in terms of the democratic constitution of knowledge with other communities and other stakeholders finally i think that the, the other element that that runs through the vision and that all of you have mentioned is the notion of restoring dignity amplifying voice and an agency uh, this is something that applies not only to knowledge production, not only to the act of teaching and learning, but also to the manner in which the university sees itself and examines its own culture and its own ability to be a welcoming space, to be a space in which we all have voices and we all feel recognized and, and in which our humanity is shared. Uh, in respectful and, and, and dignified ways. So I, I think that with this level of energy, uh, uh, Vice Chancellor, we have lots of food of thought for the for the uh, for Vision 2030, and uh, and and I think that we have lots of things to do together. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Les, for those remarks. But also thank you to Professor Perez for moderating such a thought-provoking panel discussion. Decolonial thinking is not just about reviewing the past. Oftentimes, people think it's about the past. I mean, it was interesting seeing the debate or the pseudo-debate that happened on the UCT Twitter page when they saw the announcement. And people saying, how do you even talk about decolonization on the internet, on Twitter? Well, decolonization, decolonial thinking is not about reviewing the past. It is about creating a better future, drawing on the past and owning the past. I'm also celebrating the fact that we are looking at the future through the eyes of black women and that that in itself is a disruption of colonial and patriarchal thinking. Of course, this webinar has been dominated by women. It's not by design. We selected them because of the work that they're doing. But I think the dominance of black women in this webinar has to be acknowledged as part of the disruption of colonial and patriarchal thinking. And I want to acknowledge everyone who participated because your presence as well as what you say is important. It has been a privilege to hear from so many forward thinkers today. Floretta and Chose, Loazi, as well as Shadrach, thank you very much for the work that you've done over the three years. It is clear that it was good investment. And as Elalwani said, we've got to show what we believe in by investing in it. I thank each of you, the panelists, as well as the DVCs, for the insights you have contributed towards the ongoing conversation on decol of decolonization at UCT. I also wish to thank Professor Sue Harrison for chairing this webinar and colleagues in the communications and marketing department for organizing and managing this event. Vision 2030 colleagues, is about us reclaiming our African agency and doing this kind of work is an important part of that. They will be pushed back but we must never be deterred. We should remain focused. This is about our future. It's about a sus building a sustainable future. If we do not do this, our excellence and who we are will always be challenged. 
let me thank each and every one of you who attended the, 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 the webinar. Um, thank you for joining us. Please visit the University of Cape Town website to find out more about upcoming events or to revisit podcasts of recent events. I know many of you asked about the link of the recording of this webinar. We will make it available. Uh, my hope is that it will not be edited. Um, we would like it for people to get it unedited so that people get a sense of everything that was discussed here today. So if it's unedited, it should be there sooner rather than later. Colleagues, thank you very much for joining us. Have a good day.